Uh, good morning to all our friends and colleagues from all around the world. We're very happy that you've joined us and the people that have registered for the webinar. First of all, thank you and welcome to you all. Um, I think we will all agree that this is a very, very relevant topic. Um, and it has turned the world of work upside down completely. Uh, and everybody has got different views on it. I first want to thank especially our speakers. We've got nine speakers for today from eight countries around the world. And we're very happy that they've agreed to join us. And then I want to thank the technical team that we've got on standby here today uh, and the support that we've got from them. Um, I know it's not always easy to try and organize these things, especially on a very short notice. Just a few words from my side before we start with our first speaker. Um, the, we are not promoting that people should be vaccinated or don't be vaccinated. We don't try and promote compulsory vaccination. The whole idea of today's discussion is the implications it can have in the workplace specifically. Um, can an employer say, if you're not vaccinated, you can't come into the workplace? Uh, and if that is the case, is there any form of disciplinary action that can be taken against that particular employee? And we will try and get some perspectives from different people uh, from all over the world and how they've experienced it in their specific countries. Um, and what I'm saying now is tongue in the cheek. And now I, uh, director of uh, people and culture at university, um, have also signed up for the webinar. But after our president announced not too long ago that South Africa is now on lockdown level one, the staff at the Uni Northwest University don't have any excuses anymore not to go to the offices as from Monday because we're in a recess now. But let's see what happens and wait and see if we get any communication from our um, vice chancellor and principal. Um, the first speaker I'm going to introduce to you is Ms. Susanna Muscat Gorska. She's the legal officer from the legal unit of the International Trade Union Confederation in, uh, based in Brussels in Belgium. And we thank, want to thank her for sharing her ideas with us. It's over to you, Susanna. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be on this uh, very interesting panel. I want to share my screen to um, show my presentation. Um, In, I, I will speak in my uh, personal capacity, given this uh, uh, informal character of, of uh, the webinar. Uh, in, my, uh, in my presentation, I'm interested in looking at uh, the existence, uh, or not, of the international guidance on the, on the question. So, on the acceptability of the um, no vaccine, no entry um, uh, policy, especially if it's um, unilaterally introduced by the employer. Um, in my presentation, I take a standpoint that uh, such a no vaccine, no entry policy means mandatory vaccination. Um, and uh, when we look at the word, we see that um, um, there are there's a majority of um, it, it is a major diversity in approaches in different jurisdictions. Uh, on the one side, we see uh, that in many countries, at least for some categories of workplaces and uh, sectors, such uh, uh, mandatory vaccination is um, already uh, being introduced. Uh, and uh, in these settings, in these jurisdictions, uh, if um, the uh, COVID-19 vaccination is uh, introduced in the um, regulation, national regulation, uh, such regulation would, uh, would provide with the legal basis for a no vaccine, uh, no uh, entry policy. We see sectors such as um, 
public uh, servants, uh, healthcare workers, home care workers, uh, restaurants, nightclubs, big venues. We also see that in some of these policies, sanctions for uh, workers for not being vaccinated are introduced, uh, not in all of them, in some uh, um, cases, uh, uh, we don't see uh, reports on sanctions, but we, 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 we also see that uh, um, it might be possible to even for a worker to, to, to be dismissed uh, in case uh, he or she does not uh, uh, take a vaccine. Um, but this is not uh, this is not the case for for uh, all uh, the countries and uh, in the other countries um, we don't have uh, a, a regulation introduced um, on mandatory vaccination uh, so one can say that um, there is no legal basis for no vaccine no uh, entry policy in these countries we see labor lawyers dealing with the questions that I try to to uh, list on my presentation. Um, these issues are uh, really in the process, so uh, we, I think we all feel that, that uh, it's a very changing uh, legal context. But um, in many jurisdictions, uh, we see the jurisdictions where no, entry, no vaccine, no entry policy would be acceptable. Uh, it would be okay for an for a, for a employer to introduce uh, such measure. In others, uh, such policy uh, could carry a um, risk, uh, quite a high risk for the employer in regards of the complaints uh, by the employees for breach of their um, data protection rights, uh, discrimination based on health status, uh, breach of contract uh, or, um, for example, unfair labor practice if such policy uh, was introduced without sufficient consultation with workers. And I will bring one example of the data protection regulation in the European Union. Uh, in the EU, um, there is a piece of uh, EU law, General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which is directly applicable. And um, it seems that um, uh, the provisions of uh, this piece of uh, data protection law could uh, could pose um, a significant barrier uh, for such a no vaccine no entry policy given that uh, vaccination status is a health data and the gdpr uh, protects protects health data as a sensitive data and the uh, gathering of such data uh, cannot be based solely on a com uh, com um, consent of, of a worker. In other words, it's <laughs> really um, problematic whether the employer can ask about the vaccination status. And with, uh, without this uh, question, without this no knowledge, uh, no vaccine prevention policy cannot, cannot uh, uh, exist. <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, like, there, is a, there is also an issue how trade unions responded to, 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 to mandatory testing and vaccinated, the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, we see that trade unions are uh, very active on the issue on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the workplace uh, and on the access to uh, fundamental labor, labor rights specifically. There was a discussion on this particular topic during this year's International Labour Conference in Geneva in June. Um, as regards to vaccines, uh, there is a lot of trade union advocacy uh, promoting vaccination, promoting um, getting out of, of the pandemic as soon as possible. Uh, uh, so, but, but this advocacy focus um, more on the universal access and no discrimination. Uh, so it's pro-access. Then from the unions, especially from the countries that I uh, listed, where the mandatory um, uh, vaccination was introduced for certain sectors, the question becomes much more uh, specific and and uh, and uh, probably complicated. We see. Um, variety of approaches. In some of the countries uh, where mandatory vaccination was introduced, we even see variety of stand, trade union stand, standpoints within one country. So it's really, uh, for instance, in, in the US uh, or in Canada, 
it's really also uh, a big uh, challenge for, for the unions. Uh, and um, some of the unions uh, um, try really to find a balance between uh, being pro, pro public health, obviously, uh, but at the same time, uh, not missing on, on uh, obvious dangers for, for labor rights and human rights that uh, such, a, such, a, such a policy could, could bring. Uh, this is the case. Like we see this kind of, of uh, concerns uh, being voiced in, in, in the UK, in France, in Italy. The unions were really um, pushing the government to take, to take like a complete stand uh, on, on the uh, on the uh, um, mandatory vaccination, um, uh, so 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 taking a decision if we think this is the right uh, this is the right method of pro of protection, um, do adopt the legislation, but but uh, um, cover also the 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 the, the, the drawbacks, the negative side. Um, so then when we look at the, at the international guidance, we see that um, we don't have an explicit uh, language on mandatory vaccination that comes, for instance, from, from international labor uh, organization. However, we do standards that talk to about uh, protective measures and immunization uh, uh, specifically such as the recommendation 157 or recommendation 171. Uh, the standards, um, they again uh, focus on uh, protective measures in the workplace being accessible and available, rather than talking about the, the question of whether they should be obligatory. Um, we also uh, see um, very strong consultation component. So, and this comes uh, from from the Occupational Safety and Health Convention uh, number uh, 155 and also Promotional Framework number 187. Uh, so, these issues must be uh, consulted between the employer and the workers' uh, representatives as well as uh, on a tripartite basis. Uh, in, in addition, when we look at the WHO guidance on, on ethical considerations uh, that was uh, of, of mandatory vaccination that was issued in April uh, this year, we see that um, WHO also does not uh, it does not um, recommend at this moment mandatory vaccination. Uh, it doesn't really take a stand. It says we don't say yes or no, but we don't say we don't say yes for mandatory vaccination. And in, in this guidance, uh, WHO doesn't even consider universal mandatory vaccination. It also only only comments on on, on the public health care uh, um, uh, vaccination. So. Um, um, Immunization protective measures should be accessible, available, and consulted. Uh, the, pro the, the question whether they should be uh, voluntary and uh, free from coercion here, uh, that's the last part of my presentation. I wanted to, to draw your attention to the uh, instrument that was adopted in 2010, 8 and 8 uh, um, recommendation number 200. Um, this recommendation and this discussion that took place in 2010 at the International Labour Conference, where the government, workers and employers negotiated this instrument, uh, also had to consider the question of um, mandatory workplace HIV test, uh, uh, testing as a condition for uh, uh, taking up employment also <laughs> I guess um, entering the employment. Uh, that was uh, the the height of the HIV um, uh, pandemic. Uh, well, definitely the, we we shared the same feeling of urgency as uh, today. Um, there were two million deaths per, per year, uh, and workplace was recognized as a context with very high risk of transmission. That was um, for the, the sectors or workplaces such as uh, healthcare, obviously, 
uh, armed forces and the police. But basically, what we saw is that uh, given a very, uh, like, when, we, when we consider uh, workplaces with very poor working conditions and with no access to occupational safety and health, every occupational accident because of the spill of blood, which is the mode of transmission, was uh, uh, exposing the work workers uh, to the risk of the HIV infection. Uh, and uh, uh, when, we, when we look at the data, uh, we have, uh, and this is extremely, extremely un, under, un, unreported uh, statistics, but the ILO considers that uh, um, we have three, 140 million occupational accidents uh, per year. This is a very, very modest uh, uh, estimate. So it was very tempting to solve this problem uh, by mandatory workplace uh, testing as prevention and protection measure in the workplace. Uh, and the committee had to, had to consider this question. And we had extremely difficult discussions because at that time, some countries, uh, including quite powerful countries, did have mandatory testing uh, for healthcare in their national regulations. And they didn't want, uh, they really fought strongly for, for having this reflected in the international uh, guidance that it is okay. Um, finally, uh, the, the, uh, the committee this, uh, decided against that. So when you look uh, at the provision of of the um, uh, of the HIV recommendations, paragraph, paragraph 24, it says HIV tests should be generally voluntary and free of any coercion, and that was uh, that was very much supported and pushed through by the workers and employers. And uh, of note, we had a employer spokesperson from South Africa, and we had a worker spokesperson from South Swaziland, and then the workers and employers were supported by the uh, Africa group in, in the ILO. At that time, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was responding, respond, like it was carrying the burden of 70% of HIV-related deaths. So these, this extremely uh, at risk and affected uh, uh, region and workers and employees decided that no, uh, the testing uh, will provide us with a false sense of security um, and it will it will uh, um, not bring on the promise of protecting others against infection while extremely extremely severely affecting uh, the carrying the, 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 discrimina the discrimination risk and the risk of, of the violation of other of other uh, um, fundamental labor and human rights. So uh, I think, uh, yes, that's all for that I wanted to bring to this uh, discussion uh, in, in this um, introductory part of, of, the, of, the, of the panel. And um, thank you very much. Um, OK, thank you, Susanna. Do you mind if I ask you one or two questions out from my side? I know you've got another appointment. Um, I find it very interesting the part you said about the testing for HIV and AIDS, do you think the same principles will apply with testing for COVID? I think that, that indeed, um, no, I'm, not a doctor, uh, I'm not a medical doctor, obviously, I don't have any expertise, medical expertise, but obviously even for laymen, these are such different health conditions. Um, HIV, uh, for the moment, uh, HIV infection is for life, so it's enough to test positively once to, to carry the, uh, uh, to be identified as, as HIV positive. So this is not the case for COVID. Uh, for, for, for the moment, we rather have the same, um, um, like not being vaccinated is, is uh, uh, in, in similar way, uh, definitional for the status. So I see, uh, I see the, the similarities uh, with the with the vaccination status as well in in, in the in the in the workplace contracts and in the context of disclosure of this uh, health information. Uh, but um, yes, the standard is is about uh, uh, is about testing of vaccination. I would argue that there are 
similarities when, when we, when we uh, examine the rationales of, of, uh, uh, of the prohibition of, of okay. mandatory HIV testing. Mm. HIV testing is, is quite specific, uh, given that, as, as I said, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we test positive uh, ones. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, is there maybe some of the other panel members that would like to ask Susanna a question or two before we see if our next speaker is available? Just give an indication by raising your hand on your screen, I think. Um, it doesn't, doesn't look like if there's any other questions. Um, Susanna, then once again, thank you very much for your time and effort. We really appreciate it. Uh, from your perspective, then, Belgium, and good luck with your next appointment and your hard work that you're doing that side of the world. Thank you very much. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Um, I don't know if our next speaker, Professor Beryl Terhar, is online. Hi Paul, I'm here. All right, good morning Beryl. I'm just going to introduce Beryl to you. Um, I've met Beryl in the Netherlands a couple of years ago. She was at the University of Amsterdam at Ufa, and then she was at the University of Leiden. Currently, Beryl Terhaar is professor and head of the Center of International and European Labor Law Studies at the University of Warsaw in Poland. Um, and Beryl, a special thanks to you. You've put me into contact with most of the speakers because you've got much more contacts being that side of the world than I have. So Beryl, I really appreciate that. And the floor is yours. Beryl, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to involve so many of my friends. Um, I have a prepared, prepared a presentation, so you're going to have to watch my hat uh, <laughs> while making my talk. Um, as agreed, I will focus on uh, a more fundamental rights perspective, especially how it is looked up on here uh, in uh, Europe. Um, uh, briefly, I will first address uh, like what kind of rights are being discussed to be uh, infringed here or should be protected uh, more broadly uh, in general, but also in relation to uh, employment. Then I will move to like the kind of justifications and how it is looked up on uh, in relation to vaccines, um, to the proportionality test, which is always present when we're talking about the infringement of fundamental rights. Uh, and I will elaborate a little bit there also with some commentaries on what I'm still missing at the moment in the debates about this. And then I will conclude with some uh, more um, specific uh, uh, conclusions on uh, uh, access to work. So when we're talking about fundamental rights, uh, and of course we're talking about access to work, but still uh, the OID vaccines is linked to a much broader uh, field. So um, and, and involves many more rights. So when we look at, uh, at the literature that exists so far, when we're talking about vaccines, it's about uh, um, the right to life, about the uh, right to respect for private and family life, and uh, the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And uh, in the EU, we find all of these rights in the European Charter of Human Rights. And here we can find some, uh, uh, what you could formulate as uh, um, dilemmas. So, for example, when we're talking about the right to life, we're talking about a positive obligation of the state, of the state to prevent uh, lives from being avoidably put at risk. But also, of course, the classical interpretation of negative rights to intervene and to kill. And of course, when we're talking about vaccines, it is about protecting the, uh, the positive obligation of the state to protect, especially the vulnerable uh, people in our society. Uh, with this idea of creating herd immunity, where vaccines play uh, uh, a big role. And this needs to be balanced down with having the vaccines and um, uh, what the impact of the vaccine is on the life of the individual. Um, 
when we're talking about the impact of vaccines on the life of individuals, legally so far there seems to be sort of a, a, a line both in uh, court cases, which are few and all relate actually to vaccines for children and not uh, that much in relation to uh, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. But in general, if someone dies as a consequence of a vaccine, it is considered as an unintentional killing. And somehow that, that doesn't really fall under the obligation, uh, of, the, or, yeah, obligation of the state to stay out of uh, people's lives. Um, and in relation to this, it can uh, vaccines can only be accepted when there is also enough space uh, for especially medical exceptions uh, in case people cannot take the vaccine for proven medical reasons. Um, so this is quite basic about the right to life and talking about vaccines. The other one is the right to privacy. Here also we have a negative obligation of the state not to interfere with people's private lives. Uh, when we're talking about uh, mandatory compulsory uh, vaccines, then in fact uh, the, the state is uh, intruding on a private life because it is telling you as a private person that you have to take the vaccine. It is somehow controlling, controlling it. At the same time, the state also has this positive obligation to ensure respect for private life, for example, by setting a legal framework. And when we are talking about work, I think we can uh, relate this here to uh, uh, the, the rules that we have about occupational health and safety, which could be considered as a framework coming from the state to protect lives in the work situation. And uh, in that context, we could also share uh, the employers asking for vaccines to get access to work. But if you then take a further look when we're talking about vaccines in general, uh, uh, but also uh, maybe more specific in the relationship with employment, then we see that it is mostly considered, at least here in Europe, as an issue of data protection as an issue of uh, a, a risk of giving the employer some private data about you, about your medical status, which is strongly protected, of course. Uh, but it's a form of risk management. Uh, and based on the further rules that we have in Europe, especially coming from the EU with the general data protection regulation, it becomes a form of risk management uh, on how the employer is dealing with the data, but we're not talking anymore about to what extent are employees infringed on their private right. It is kind of uh, accepted, uh, and, and all of this is accepted in the idea of that we have to make this right to privacy from a more uh, collective point of view to what it mean, what the infringement means for the personal. Uh, the, the individual person. So it becomes a, a, a balance between the risk of being vaccinated, which is actually considered already on the Article 2, the risks for the, the right to life, versus what is infringed to be protected, that is your privacy, but well, given the broader context, and we come to that a bit later when we're talking about justifications and, and proportionality tests, um, in general, it is considered that the individual's interest need to uh, make place for that of the, of the collective. Now, the third right that I introduced, uh, the freedom of thought, conscience and religion, formulated in Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights, there's, um, first of all, a distinction made between thought and conscience, versus religion. And secondly, when we're talking about thought and conscience, there was also a uh, distinction made between what is happening internally in you and to what extent that is being infringed and all the external aspects of having uh, 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 thought and, and uh, conscience. And in general, when we're talking about compulsory vaccination, it is considered that 
this is not an infringement of what is happening internally in you. You can still have your thoughts, you can still have your conscience, that is not being threat enough, uh, but um, the, the, the vaccination uh, have it, or having the vaccination is not considered as an intrusion of what is happening inside your mind. You're not being blocked from having your thoughts, ideas, etc. about the vaccine. Even if you believe, have a conscience that you do not believe in the vaccine itself, for this internal uh, way of thinking, it is considered not to be intrusive. Uh, when we're talking about the forum external, um, it is also not considered as an infringement because the obligation itself is provided for in a general and neutrally phrased act. So if it would constitute anything, or it's not directed at you personally or um, because you have certain thoughts or convictions, it is generally and may impact you maybe a little bit more than others but then it is presumed that that can be justified. So in itself, it is not considered as an infringement. A bit weird, but it is. Um, when we're talking about religion, um, the story is a bit different because here the court, uh, at least the European Court of Human Rights, and also in literature, it's not that much debated, it is considered uh, mandatory uh, or compulsory vaccinations are considered as an intrusion of, uh, on religion, especially uh, if it is considered to be a strong part of how you uh, experience your beliefs, what kind of rules you are living by, that are set by the belief, etc. Still, we have some forms of religion, or more qualified as belief, that are uh, less clear. And here we're talking especially about uh, the idea of, of uh, veganism or vegetarians as a form of uh, a conviction of how you live your life. And the issue is that with many vaccines, often they uh, um, hold elements of animals. And uh, before a vaccine can be put on the market, they have to be tested on animals. That is one of the protocols that we need to follow. Uh, and uh, a lot of vegans, vegetarians, don't want to uh, use these kind of products in general. So they also have their sort of uh, conscience obligation against uh, uh, having the vaccine. And here, um, the courts are still a bit going two ways whether uh, this can be protected under religion, yes or no. But that's an open question still. Um, then moving to uh, justifications, because once it is established that we have an infringement, there is also always the opportunity, the possibility to justify the infringement. Um, and in general, we have this uh, open uh, uh, phrase of that it needs to have an appropriate legal base, pursues a legitimate aim, and is necessary in a democratic society. Um, and when we're talking about the positive obligation, then the justification also includes making a fair balance between the general interest of the community and the interest of the individual. Now, when talking about legitimate aims and, and relation with vaccines, they are to be found in the interest of public safety, public health, uh, or morals, and the uh, protection of the rights and freedoms of others. And here it speaks for itself that we are talking about the protection of health, but that needs to be somehow still balanced with the freedoms and rights of others, right, of the individual. So that can be uh, uh, your religion or your privacy. Then when it comes to necessary in democratic society, I find it quite striking um, that there uh, is apparently a very strong consensus uh, that the highest possible vaccination coverage should be pursued um, without any considerations of alternatives for vaccines. Um, so that, uh, that it, in, and in that way it is accepted as being necessary in uh, democratic society. 
What is not, uh, or where it doesn't exist consensus is, um, is on how to achieve this. So, uh, uh, and, and achieving this is to what extent or how compulsory it should be. So for this, a proportionality test is needed um, in finding all kinds of balances. Now, when we are looking at the, uh, the um, proportionality test, there is a general rule formulated that compulsory vaccination is acceptable, proportional, when the burden on the individual is less severe than the burden on society without the compulsory vaccination. So that means that the interest of the individual actually is going to be outweighed by the interest of society, a form of solidarity in society. And yeah, the individual has to accept the infringement because of the benefits that it is going to give society. Now, what has been listed as relevant factors in weighing compulsory vaccination in terms of proportionality uh, we have the risks that accompany the vaccine process, those of the disease, when we're talking about COVID-19. Uh, we're all quite convinced that uh, the risks of the vaccine the side effects so far are a lot smaller than having uh, 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 COVID-19. Uh, the benefits of society are another point that needs to be uh, uh, another factor that needs to be weighed, and the effectiveness of the vaccine itself. Well, the effectiveness of most of the vaccines are relatively high, and the benefit to society. We all know all the arguments that without the vaccines, uh, shops will close again, we won't be able to go out again, uh, and we'll all come back to work from home mostly, or uh, with a lot of protective uh, clothes. So we, we can clearly feel a balance here. Uh, and the third factor is the way how the disease is being transmitted. So when it is transmitted from person to person, um, it is considered as a health risk that is going beyond any of the individual interests. And with COVID-19, we also know uh, that it is uh, moving from person to person through the air. Um, so we can see that substantive issues related to vaccines uh, are taken into account to address proportionality. What I find kind of striking is that apparently um, there are no aspects taken into account in the intrusiveness of the measure itself, of the fact that vaccination is being made compulsory. Uh, and in legal literature, there's not that much written about it. Then, when we're looking at um, literature more in healthcare and ethics in, in uh, medicines, um, we find some quite refined thoughts uh, from from ethical perspective, where you can make uh, what they call a uh, an intervention ladder, uh, moving from voluntary, not intrusive, restrictive, uh, or coercive to, uh, uh, at the other end of the scale, compulsion. Mm -hmm. um, and this exists of uh, a variety starting with persuasion, uh, talking about, for example, uh, education campaigns, argumentation, uh, etc. All kinds of forms of communication with the idea that it should in, uh, influence the individual's behavior. Then we have matching, where you set certain default options that makes it more easy to choose for the vaccination rather than, let's say, opt out. Um, and then moving to incentives, disincentives, and in the end, compulsion. And the last three are all considered as issues that are somehow restricting our autonomy which you could equalize more or less with having an infringement on our fundamental rights. Now, I find it weird that when we're talking about a proportionality test, which normally quite often also involves this, this thought of, was it really necessary to take this measure? And could we have done it in a less intrusive manner? But that is not considered in the existing case law uh, 
quite clearly, but it is also not discussed now in, uh, in the literature about vaccines uh, uh, in relation to COVID-19. Now, some final considerations making, uh, 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 bringing all this to uh, uh, considerations of access to work. Um, so we're talking about fundamental rights. We don't have a specific fundamental right of access to work, but often it is related to something uh, in the EU context. It is often related to the issue of discrimination. Um, but then we're talking about a lot of discrimination grounds that are not really covered here. And uh, uh, here, maybe some arguments could be made that since the vaccine or the virus is here to stay, can be considered as a long-term disease, but uh, that doesn't really fit. We need to be creative here. So <laughs> for access to work, there's not one specific uh, clear right uh, in, in the EU context that we can really rely on directly to, to find our protection. So when we're talking uh, about discrimination grounds, maybe we can find a, the, uh, an entrance via uh, discrimination on the grounds of religion, but in the end, that is only going to be indirect discrimination because it will be relied on that it is formulated in a meaningful manner. When we're talking about the right to life as a fundamental right to rely on, then um, we can put it in the context of occupational safety and health. Um, as, a, as a measure to create a healthy and safe work environment. Also in the context of the duty to protect customers. So uh, whoever comes to the shop, to, to the cafe, whatever, needs to be protected as well. But also in the healthcare sector, where uh, people work with vulnerable, or people that have been proven to be extremely vulnerable for this virus. I've already said when we're talking about the right to privacy, it seems to be only uh, uh, considered as a risk uh, for data protection. So we can't uh, uh, expect much from this. Turning to the justification, so what we find in uh, legitimate aims, the protection to save lives, but we also find uh, an argument related to the capacity, uh, compa capacity of uh, uh, related to too many workers uh, contracting the virus and then not being able to work, uh, being uh, sick uh, at home. And especially in the healthcare sector, this has been flagged out as an uh, issue. And then the third, of course, going back to occupational safety and health uh, arguments that can also be uh, used for justification as a legitimate aim. Then this requirement of necessity in democratic society. Um, here I find it really striking that uh, uh, compulsory vaccination is really uh, uh, accepted without any considerations given to testing. What uh, my uh, Susanna uh, uh, considered uh, before me. This can also be quite an effective way uh, in, in the workplace and safeguarding uh, the workplace on, from a health uh, point of view. And then we're talking about proportionality. Again, I think it's weird that there is a lack of an assessment of less intrusive manners. Uh, and and uh, I also think that uh, we, we, have, we see here a lot of general measures, but we're talking about work, access to work, uh, where we often also have uh, more sector-specific measures. So uh, I think we can all understand that for certain sectors, it might be even more important to be vaccinated than for other sectors. So when we're talking about access to employment, and um, whether uh, forced uh, or compulsory vaccination is accepted, maybe we should make a more a distinction also between the sectors and to what extent all the other aspects uh, uh, actually play a role in the uh, specific sector. Um, thank you for your attention. This is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Okay. Um, Beryl, before you go away, I've got uh, a question I would like to ask, and I think we've discussed this 
on a couple of occasions um, in Europe and also via WhatsApp, individual right versus the collective good. At what point does the individual right come to an end because it's better for society at large? Yeah. Um, what I got from all these cases about vaccination, and again, most of these cases are about children to be vaccinated, and not so much about uh, um, em uh, employees, workers, or the workplace uh, uh, relation uh, or context. So when we're talking about uh, the cases that we have dealing with children, it is always the collective, without much discussion, without much attention to it. So uh, apparently the, the, the only interest of the individual that is respected is for medical implications. If there is a medical reason that you should not get a vaccine, then that is kind of accepted, but other reasons are basically never really accepted. Okay, thank you. Is there any one of the other panel members that would perhaps like to ask a better question? Just raise your hand on your screen and the IT person will pick it up. Uh, it doesn't look all right. Uh, Beryl, once again, it's always nice to listen to you. You can see you've got vast of experience and thank you for your presentation. It was really fascinating, um, the point of view you had and we want to thank you. And as I said previously to all the panel members, hopefully we can have a follow-up next year with a similar thing. And hopefully it can be face-to-face -face in South Africa in October uh, in 2022. Be, yeah. That would be perfect. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Beryl. Have a super day. Thank you. All right. I, um, I hope Professor Nicolas Moisart has joined us. Um, I'm first going to introduce Professor Mozart to his Professor of Private Law and Criminal Science and then also Director of the Institute of Labour at Strasbourg University in France. Uh, Professor Mozart, thank you very much for your willingness to participate and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation and um, I'm very happy to share the French results. Bonjour de Strasbourg. Um, I will share my uh, PowerPoint. Um, is that so right? Okay. Yes. Yes. So, uh, in France, since the beginning of the sanitary crisis, firms are covered by a protocol. Um, it's a purely soft law. Uh, and France uh, began very slowly the vaccination campaign but extended uh, since uh, last spring. President Macron uh, aimed to increase uh, vaccination with compulsory measures. Uh, he made a television speech on July, uh, which had a real effect on the vaccination campaign. Um, an act uh, was uh, adopted by Parliament uh, in August, and um, it introduces uh, two key measures affecting uh, employees and their employer and all the social life in society. Uh, the first one is the compulsory uh, vaccination against COVID for people working with vulnerable groups. And the second one is the extension of the health pass uh, to new places and events uh, and for workers who work there. Uh, the Constitutional Council approved uh, most of the Act on the basis of the objective of constitutional value, value of health protection. For Constitutional Council, uh, it was uh, proportionate, no, no problem. When I heard Beryl before, um, uh, I think about demonstration. We have uh, every Saturday in France a uh, demonstration uh, and the, uh, against uh, health pass 
and the only word is liberty. Uh, so individual <laughs> liberty. Uh, they say that they are not against vaccination, but they are against health pass, uh, compulsory uh, health pass. But uh, this is not a strong movement. Uh, it de decreased uh, every Saturday. So um, I just wanted to to show you uh, President Macron very happy <laughs> by the number of the vaccination uh, in France. So two key measures. Um, so the, the first one is the vaccination obligation. Uh, since August, uh, certain professionals, particularly in the health field, must be vaccinated against COVID. Uh, it has been a transitional period, uh, but now this is compulsory. Uh, this is, the scope is not very comprehensive. Uh, firemen are concerned, but uh, not the policemen. Sometimes, uh, perhaps uh, for electoral reason, reasons, uh, perhaps, perhaps. Um, the employer becomes the go-between uh, of the government. Failures to the by the employer to comply with the obligation to monitor compliance with the vaccination requirement uh, his sentence is by a fine, and uh, even if it's, uh, the violation is reported by the uh, one year imprisonment. So, um, I will tell you after uh, what the situation is at the moment in the hospital, but uh, uh, it's uh, important. The second measure is the extension of the health pass. Uh, extension to certain places or events with a high risk of epidemic spread. The uh, scope is very large. Um, it's uh, employees, volunteers, uh, service providers, temporary workers, subcontractors who work in establishments where the pass is required of users. Um, and in France now, the health pass is compulsory for minors over the age of uh, 12. Um, the health pass obligation should end uh, uh, in the middle of November, but the government wants to prolong it until the summer, so after the presidential election. <laughs> the parliament is... Um, is closed during this period, so no control, no democratic control. Um, in practice, uh, the workers must present a digital paper, a QR, uh, or paper format, a uh, certificate of complete vaccination schedule, or the negative uh, result of a test. But uh, the test now in France is not reimbursed by social security, so uh, that's a pressure. Um, data protection authority warns about data on the employees that the employer may retain. Um, the data cannot be retained after the inspection, uh, and the employer uh, is not allowed to ask uh, workers if they are ill or, or before. Or, and the question cannot be asked at the time of recruitment. Um, what's the consequences of employment contract? It was a strong debate in France. Um, when the employer, uh, when the, the employee, sorry, cannot present the health pass, the employee, the worker, should not work anymore. So, what happens? There are several options. The first, uh, in agreement with the employer, he can use paid holidays. St uh, very strange uh, ways to use uh, paid or rest holidays. Uh, it's for uh, security, uh, health and uh, safety. Um, if there is no agreement uh, with the employer, or 
if the employee if the employee doesn't want doesn't wish to use the rest days, um, the employer notifies the employee that he or her employment contract is suspended immediately. Suspended, hmm. no longer paid. No paid leave can yeah. be generated during this period. This suspension um, in the law is not a real decision of the employer. It seems be it seems be automatic. Um, if the suspension lasts for months for more than three days, there is an interview, and the employer must persuade. Uh, the, the worker to, to find a solution, perhaps persuade to accept the vaccination. Uh, he must convince. Um, several solutions can be um, um, chosen. Uh, redeployment, but uh, redeployment is a simple option. And mm -hmm. firms must have a post uh, uh, who are compatible, who are uh, with uh, this obligation. Teleworking, uh, but if the position is eligible with this type of work. And uh, uh, so, uh, at the end, in the event of a persistent deadlock, um, surely there will be dismissal or perhaps harassment to, to, to go away, but procedure of dismissal. Um, the possibility of su generis uh, dismissal for failure to provide a health pass after two months is initially sought by the government, was removed by the parliament. So those are ordinary rules uh, to, uh, to dismiss. Um, Um, it can, uh, in the case of permanent contracts, in the event of deadlock, the employer could dismiss the employer on the ground of objective disturbance to the smooth running of the company. Uh, what will be the level um, for the judge of the objective disturbance? So the situation is different for compulsory vaccinations. In this, stage, this situation, um, perhaps the employer could take disciplinary action. Uh, as Barry say, uh, the, um, there is perhaps a, a potential discrimination in religion and bel or belief. Um, and perhaps if there are cases, a uh, judge would create a right to redeployment, to reclassification measures. But that's not in the law. Uh, in the act. Uh, so we have uh, an uncertainty in the rules. Those rules are not uh, in the uh, international rules of the firms. Um, there is uh, not a real information and consultation of working council. Um, the labor controlling authority cannot really control in the firm. So this is a very strange situation. Um, in the hospital, at, um, there are only uh, a few, um, a score of uh, workers who refuse uh, vaccination, but uh, this is a significant shortage uh, of staff at hospital uh, because suspended workers are not replaced. Uh, so, um, the friends. Uh, as um, those two measures uh, now, uh, compulsory measures. Uh, for long times, a soft law was enough. Uh, for several months, uh, Ministry of Labor told to firms that distant uh, relations uh, between people and masks was enough. But uh, now that's a higher level. That's why I wanted to share the, uh, with you about the uh, French uh, situation. And, um, um, I have a lecture uh, uh, in uh, uh, 30 uh, minutes, but can, uh, uh, if you have questions, uh, with pleasure. Thank you. Um,
Uh, thank you, Professor Mozart. Um, what I found very, very interesting is how did the trade union movement in France react towards this health pass, compulsory vaccinations? Did they accept it? Were they involved in the discussions? Because I cannot see the trade union movement in South Africa ever to agree to anything like that. And um, that's uh, very interesting because unions have a different point of view of the matter. You know the French situation, we have uh, several unions uh, important at the national level, uh, not very important in terms. Uh, we have uh, about 8% uh, uh, of workers who, who are in unions. But uh, the first uh, union in France, uh, reformist unions, is uh, favorable, is for uh, vaccination. The others say that we are a uh, uh, CGT, the second one. Uh, with more left um, is opposed to the past, to the health pass, not mm. to the vaccination, but to the health pass, to the compulsory, to the effect on the uh, relation, working relation. So, um, uh, uh, unions are not uh, very important in this, in this <laughs> debate. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating that trade unions aren't very uh, important in this debate. And I found it fascinating that they're not really against vaccination, but they're against the health pass. Maybe they view the health pass as a restriction on their movement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so that could be. So th there is a, a question about uh, um, what can we do for... Um, an elected uh, worker uh, or a union shop uh, uh, shop stewards who refuse vaccination can, can he go on to go in the firm and uh, to 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 meet the workers and to protest and uh, uh, that was a, that was a question we had. <laughs> yeah, um, somebody just passed me a note here. Uh, in the case where a dismissal now becomes evident because this person doesn't have the health pass, etc. Will it be based on failure to carry the health pass or will it boil down to retrenchment or operational requirements? What will be Sorry. the reason for Sorry, this? I have, my, I have my desk and I have my phone. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Okay, no, all right. Um, if a person is dismissed for failure to carry a health pass or presenting a health pass, what will be the reason for dismissal? Because if you know, I'll own Convention 158 says it must be for a good and valid reason based on misconduct, incapacity, or operational requirements? What would be the reason for dismissal? Um, this is specific for firemen, um, because um, they are not uh, under labor code. They are in public sector. OK. And uh, in public sector, they only say um, they are suspended. But uh, this is a very new situation in public sector. OK. Uh, so. Uh, we don't know what happens uh, in the long time. Uh, what means a suspension without pay? Um, uh, it, is the, uh, it could be disciplinary measures because there is a, uh, this is different of the health pass. This is an obligation of vaccination. Vaccination. Mm, okay. I don't know if I. Uh, yes. It was uh, the answer. Or? Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I think um, for all of us, we will have to wait until we've had a few cases before our courts to see how our courts rule on this. At this stage, it's a little bit of speculation on all sides. So, Professor Mozart, thank you very, very much for your presentation you. from France. We really enjoyed that. And good luck with your lecture. I know you've said you've got another lecture <laughs> just very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Um, is Prof Professor Nikita Lyotov online? Um, all right, let me introduce Professor Nikita Lyotov. I met him, I think, in 2013 in Barcelona. No, it was in Italy, actually, at the Moderna Conference. And since then, we've become very, very good friends. Professor Lyotov is Professor and Head of Department uh, of Labor and Social Security Law at the Kutafin Moscow State Law University in Russia. And then I'm also happy to say that he's an extraordinary professor 
in our School of Industrial Psychology and Human Resource Management here at the Northwest University in South Africa. So Nikita, thank you very much. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm sorry I don't have much voice. I hope it's not Corona. It is just <laughs> a seasonal flu, <clears throat> but still it's rather difficult to talk. And uh, thank you very much for the wonderful topic that you have offered us to discuss. I, I think it is very interesting to see the situation which is probably the most well discussable in each national context, uh, but to see it from the different uh, angle. And what I was hearing now from Drill and Nicola, uh, to a certain ext uh, extent resembles uh, the situation in Russia, although it is obviously not the same. Uh, first of all, uh, um, I must say that uh, this, the vaccination in uh, Russia is not compulsory. Formally, formally, uh, uh, not compulsory meaning that well, no one is obliged, uh, neither on federal level or in any of the territories of Russia, to pass uh, the vaccination. However, uh, Mm, the general topic of the seminar, no vaccine, no entry, uh, answers very much to the situation which is in Russia. Because um, now I'm coming to the formal, b before I come to the formal uh, part uh, dealing with uh, the legal issues, I must say that uh, the vaccination level in Russia is rather modest. Despite the fact that we have uh, around five different vaccines which are invented and produced in Russia, uh, the level of vaccination is quite modest. Uh, we were first to start producing the vaccine, but up to now, to this day, we have only 33.3% uh, vaccinated. And uh, this number is much bigger now, uh, because uh, still it is quite modest compared to um, developed countries, but it is much bigger than uh, the situation before the limitations um, which started in the summer uh, of this year and which uh, deal with uh, the suspension, which uh, Nicola was talking about. Uh, uh, and uh, it is more or less the same in Russia. In labor code, uh, we have also the labor code, which was, uh, was adopted in 2001. Uh, we have an article, a specific article 76, which provides, uh, provides for the possibility to lay off the employee without pay in the um, situations which are specifically envisaged by the federal law. And there is such a federal law. It was adopted in 1998, uh, the federal law on immunoprophylaxis on infectious diseases, which uh, contains two different and to a certain extent uh, controversial, controversial provisions. One of them states that um, the chief sanitary doctor of the region may take a decision on compulsory vaccination in cases of epidemics. Uh, it is not said there that uh, such limitation must cover any specific uh, profession in this article. It is only providing for the general right of the regional Senatory General to announce this compulsory vaccination. Uh, and uh, also this law provides that uh, or the person has the right to refuse uh, the vaccination. Uh, this re resembles uh, the issues which Beril was talking about, uh, considering the freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, um, but in such cases, this person may be lay all, laid off from works which uh, are associated with the high risk of uh, infection. Here, this uh, provision is more specific because it deals with the specific works which, uh, which are associated with the high risk. There is uh, this list of works and uh, it is approved by the resolution of government uh, which was adopted more than 20 years ago and um, it is renewed from year to year. And currently it also contains the COVID virus. 
um, but uh, uh, it, le it contains both the list of infections and uh, uh, also the list of works uh, which uh, deal uh, with uh, big amount of population. And although it um, includes education, it doesn't include many other public professions which currently fall uh, within this layoff programs, which actually started in different reg regions. Uh, I must make a remark here that um, Russian Federation, well, judging uh, already from its name, is a federal state. But if we compare Russia with uh, other uh, federal states, like, for example, United States or Canada, uh, the division of powers between the Federation and the subjects of Federation uh, is uh, territories is uh, much more unified in our case. It is much more of a um, Mm, uh, monetary uh, state uh, rather than um, these federal states. But in this case, uh, after the uh, spread of COVID, uh, the regulation of uh, limitations uh, and uh, different benefits actually started being much more federal. Uh, and uh, it seemed that regions started reacting more proactively uh, to the situation compared to the president and the federal government. So each different region um, has introduced uh, its own program of uh, limitation, depending on the ideas of the level of uh, spread of COVID in different territories. For example, in Moscow, there is a resolution of mayor of Moscow who um, uh, provided uh, that in the number of sectors, including uh, public foods, financial services, and others, which, uh, this is important, are not included in this government uh, list of professions. So he provided that uh, they all uh, must, the employers in these sectors must um, provide at least 60% of staff being vaccinated and all of them who are uh, working with the public must pass uh, the vaccination. Um, the contradiction here is that uh, the federal law in one article deals with the general law or with the general rule that the sanitary doctor may provide for um, such layoffs in general and, and the other article which says that it covers only the specific lists of uh, professions. So theoretically it may be the case for the court uh, for people in the professions like restaurants or financial services who um, have to pass uh, this uh, compulsory vaccination uh, compulsory well, formally not compulsory but uh, as the condition not to be laid off laid off without pay uh, but in practice, as um, the court system in Russia is, uh, well, I must say, frankly, not very independent from the executive uh, powers, there are very weak chances that um, the court would uh, acknowledge the right uh, of uh, these people not to be laid off without pay. So, uh, in fact, what is happening that in these public professions uh, uh, in many regions uh, in Russia, people have to uh, reach these benchmarks of 60% and all of uh, people who work uh, with public have to be vaccinated. We, have, uh, we had this campaign uh, in summer and now it reached its goals, but still, uh, as I already told, in in the general, we have only 33% of vaccinated, but this may be explained by the fact that uh, not all the professions are dealing with uh, public, uh, public works and uh, uh, not all people actually are in place. So, well, this is more or less uh, reasonable statistic uh, picture. So um, 
this is the formal uh, framework, which is uh, the, the, the thing which is more important is uh, the, any kind of contradiction uh, between the right to work uh, of the employee and uh, the right of safety, uh, because uh, many trade unions and employees uh, started being concerned with uh, labor rights uh, currently in the summer of 2021, after um, this uh, new regulation uh, came into power. Um, and started being actually attracted to labor law. It was much less interest to labor law, public interest, I mean, outside the academia or trade unions uh, before um, these limitations, despite the fact that we have lots of different gaps in our regulations, which uh, I would say affect labor rights much more seriously than this um, specific right. But. Uh, it became in the public in the center of public discussion right now, and the people uh, started complaining about their right to work, which is affected by the obligation. In fact, the obligation, although formally it is not an obligation, but the condition to work, to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I would say that from um, uh, the conceptual problem, as the general rule, it looks to be okay, because if the um, person, for example, if the teacher uh, wants to work physically with uh, other people, uh, it is reasonable to uh, expect that this teacher is less dangerous after vaccination from the point of view of spreading the disease than if he or she would not be vaccinated. But uh, um, there may be serious problems, and this is what I have personally have seen in my department when I was one of the executives which had uh, to look after the employees and to get the certificates that some of the employees uh, had the um, problems with uh, the getting a medical document uh, with a statement that uh, they cannot be vaccinated on the medical reasons. Uh, so there is no clear uh, formal explanation what to do in the situation first when they do uh, have uh, this uh, medical documents because uh, there is a statement that the people who are not vaccinated can be laid off. Uh, but if there are uh, physical problems with this, uh, there is no further explanation. Most of employers in this case uh, just uh, leave um, these people who cannot be vaccinated in the 40%. Uh, I already said that 60% of employees have to be vaccinated and the rest of them maybe not. So they try to, uh, take them out of uh, the physical contact. Uh, for example, the teachers may go on or teaching either with written works or uh, using Teams or um, Zoom um, as they actually do. But what we have faced in the summer that um, the doctors had the unofficial instruction from the medical authorities to uh, uh, avoid giving the medical prescriptions uh, uh, regarding the vaccination against the vaccination. So uh, they were saying the patients that, well, as the doctor, I'm saying you orally that <clears throat> it is wrong for you to get vaccinated, but I cannot give you the medical document. So the people were facing the threat to the employment without any fault or believe uh, beliefs uh, in anything against the vaccination just because they couldn't obtain this document. And another not very clear um, issue here is, uh, well, not everywhere it is possible to organize this non-contact uh, part of work and there is no clear explanation what to do in such a situation. Uh, for example, the person has uh, the medical document, but cannot, um, or the employer cannot uh, organize the remote work or other way of work, which would 
prevent from the contact, uh, prevent the contacts with uh, the people. Uh, so there is uh, a practice of employers uh, not to lay off such people, but there is no clear understanding what would happen if the employer would not meet this 60% threshold. And probably the last problem which I wanted to talk about is uh, the informal workers which uh, don't have any rights in this situation. They just uh, have no employment in such situations. And uh, the platform workers, which uh, unlike many other countries in Russia, uh, don't have the status uh, of employees, even in the sectors where, uh, where in other countries like France, for example, or Spain, they already gain or have gained the status of employees like taxi drivers or delivery services in our case. The case law currently is against them, so our they don't have the status of employee and it is not clear whether their <clears throat> entrepreneurs have to suspend them from work or not. So you see, well, I'm not focusing on the big conceptual issues which Beril was talking about regarding the proportionality and uh, freedom of choice here. I was focusing rather more on the practical issues, but you see, the most problematic of them is that the problems with the obtaining the medical certificate. Then if the, the second one, if the person has the uh, medical certificate, which states that uh, he or she cannot be vaccinated, what should be done if the employee cannot organize the remote uh, work? And the third big issue is the informal and platform workers, which do not enjoy anything in such situations. So this is what I wanted to say regarding the issue. That you're a little bit sick, um, but it's fascinating that they say 60% must be vaccinated and um, that's the level you must reach. So one would think that they say 60% is basically herd immunity type of thing. I find it, why yeah. did they decide on 60%? Yeah, 60% is about this idea that it is enough to, getting, to get the collective immunity. But as we see now from other countries with higher level of uh, vaccination, high rates, uh, it doesn't work this way. Uh, even when they have 80% and more, they still have problems uh, with it, but probably yeah. less problems, less death. We are now experiencing the fourth wave and the record, the peak levels of death, uh, at least uh, judging by official statistics, which are not very trustworthy. <laughs> but the, uh, I would say that uh, we have a very, very different level. We had the um, parliament elections two weeks ago, and before these parliament elections, we had a very uh, high level of stability regarding the oh, yeah. death rate and uh, the infection rate. It was almost not changing. It reached 800 uh, deaths every day, and well, like 10 or less, or 10 less or more, oh, yeah. around this 800 <laughs> before the elections. And immediately after election, it started changing. Well, uh, you, you may see, well, you, you, it's not very trustworthy, but at least uh, what we see is the problem is there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, the idea was to get this uh, threshold of 60%, yeah. which we are actually very far from. Uh, Nikita, I remember at one stage you mentioned, um, it was an, our WhatsApp group, that you said that you had to deal with a situation in your own department at university where some of the staff didn't want to be vaccinated, etc. And how did that work out in the end? What happened to those staff members? In the end, uh, yes. only, uh, we have uh, 23 uh, people uh, in our department. Most of, most of them currently are vaccinated. Uh, three of them get the medical certificate. And one of them was told by the doctors that um, she cannot be vaccinated and she doesn't have the certificate, so only she is now 
uh, is laid off without pay since the 1st of September. Ah. Uh, frankly speaking, in her case, I think, uh, well, she is overthinking about her state of health uh, because she is like uh, 10 years younger than me, and I know that. Um, well, probably in her case, I, I suspect that doctors are not giving her the medical prescription because probably there is no such a big problem to, uh, for her to get yeah. vaccinated, but this is her choice. Not yeah. Cheese, yeah, thank you very much. Nikita, you mentioned the elections. Well, we've got elections coming up in about a month's time. Uh, and just before the elections, um, the president reduced the levels of lockdown in South Africa. So I think it will also have an influence. But uh, as we say, uh, I remember a few Russian words. And you must have a vodka. It will really help for the call to the flu. So Strovia and Spasiba. Thank you very much, Nikita. Uh, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, uh, just a short remark regarding this. We have a friendly state also with problems with democracy, uh, which is Belarus. And their uh, notorious president, uh, who was almost overthrown last summer in 2020, but it could uh, sit on his place uh, with force, when the COVID started, started explaining that the bad treatment for uh, COVID is vodka and work in the field, uh, <laughs> and so eating potatoes. Then he had his own COVID uh, himself and many other people uh, there. So, well, just to say that you are not the only one who invents this uh, okay, no. uh, treatment. Yeah, Spasiba, thank you very much, Nikita, and all thank the best. You. Hope you improve and get well better. Our next speaker is Professor Stefan van Eck. He's a professor in labor law at the University of Pretoria here in South Africa. And I'm also very happy to say that he was my study leader for my PhD. Um, so Stefan, it's always nice to listen to you and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. And uh, also for all of your arrangements, uh, Paul. Uh, I think it's an excellent opportunity to see the faces of some of our colleagues and to also discuss this hot topic that is really impacting on most workplaces uh, in the world, as it is, it is clear from this discussion as well. Um, just before I started off, I was wondering if I could pose a question to Nikita, if he is still uh, there and still with us. <clears throat> he referred to uh, the one colleague um, who has been laid off and uh, I was just wondering uh, was it a step uh, that was taken by the university to say was the initiative taken from the employer to say well under these circumstances unfortunately you can't work here anymore or did she rather uh, resign uh, or, or what, what is the status of that employee that would be of quite a bit of interest to me um don't know if Nikita is still online. Um, uh, well, I can also take it up with him later on. We do have his contact details, okay. and I uh, will be discussing that with him at the, at the later stage. But without further ado, let me see if I can share my uh, uh, presentation with you. Um, just bear me with me for, for a moment. And... Uh, and let's see if we can get a road. Yeah, there it is. Is, is that yes. fine? Can you see that, Bo? Yeah, we can. Well, just to, to kick, uh, kick the discussion off, um, <clears throat> most countries have had a uh, very big impact of COVID on their own societies. In our situation, we've... Uh, our death toll is approaching 88,000 people who have lost their lives tragically. Of those, uh, almost 2.2 million, so we're going towards uh, 3 million people have, have contracted uh, COVID-19. And uh, at the moment, uh, we, we have uh, around 48,000 uh, active cases. That being said, we have come through our third wave and uh, 
So that is, uh, um, we're in a bit of a dip at the moment where uh, uh, luckily we, we, we don't have um, a resurgence at the moment. But uh, as Paul has alluded to, we are, uh, uh, we've lowered our protection rate, so we're at level one at the moment. But uh, the expectancy is that over December, mm. we will probably have our a fourth wave. But that being said, um, the COVID pandemic has had a, a devastating uh, effect, almost immeasurable um, in our society, as with most, most other countries. Many job losses. We've had uh, an increase in the applications for sick leave. We've had large-scale layoffs. We've got uh, restaurants that have closed. Um, even if one just visits a shopping mall, one can see the open spaces all over. Um, and definitely also a decline in, in, in productivity. Now, prior to the, vac uh, to, uh, to the vaccines that uh, many countries actually all over the world have been awaiting keenly, um, and there was, I don't know if you can remember, almost the race that we experienced of different uh, companies who um, all um, tried to win the other companies by getting the vaccine on the shelves, the earliest tests that have been, been done. But prior to that, our only main defenses were the ones of personal protective uh, equipment, um, distancing, and of course, something that's become more and more uh, prevalent in South Africa is the issue of just proper ventilation and outdoor activities. Much more evidence is being placed on that. But from what we hear in South Africa, what the scientists tell us is that there's overwhelming scientific evidence that vaccination is the best strategy at this stage uh, to uh, to curb the number of uh, people in the uh, intensive care units and hospitals. And also uh, our latest statistics show uh, that, uh, uh, that the people who are taken into the uh, intensive care units and those who die proportionately, there are very many more people who die at this stage who have not been vaccinated compared to those who have been uh, vaccinated. Now, there is quite a significant resistance in South Africa also to the, the, the vaccine policy. And it is certainly also the policy of the government of the day at the moment to encourage, but not to compel the taking of vaccines. So the news is out there and we receive it on our News 24 and all other ways of communication Please go and vaccinate, but with that, the sentence is always added, uh, it is not compulsory. However, a hefty debate has started in South Africa since uh, some uh, quite big and influential uh, companies in the country has decided to implement compulsory vaccination. The one, ironically, is the, the, the biggest by far um, uh, uh, um, a medical scheme, Discovery Health. Uh, they've got millions of members in South Africa, but they have taken the lead and they've said that all of their staff members must be vaccinated by uh, the beginning of next year. January 2022, they will uh, insist that all of their employees must be vaccinated. Also of interest may be one of our leading universities in the country, University of Cape Town, uh, their Senate has had a debate and they had a vote and uh, the Senate of the university overwhelmingly uh, voted that there should be compulsory vaccinations at UCT, University of Cape Town. Now just of interest like what's happened there is that uh, the student bodies have now come to the fore and said, but hang on, the lecturers and the professors may have decided and uh, voted in favor of uh, staff members as well as uh, the students to take the vaccine. Now, they were not properly consulted. 
and they are now insisting that they will um, uh, derail the implementation of the vaccine policy uh, if they are not properly, uh, uh, if they are not uh, properly consulted. But so, this is the, just setting the scene, but um, taking into account what has happened at this medical scheme and also at, at University of, of Cape Town, um, the, the, the main question, first of all, um, needs to be, be posed, is all of this uh, permissible in terms of South African law? What do the legal principles say? Now, our starting point would be to uh, look at our uh, constitution. As many of you may know, we've had very many years of turbulent uh, political situation in South Africa. And then in 1994, 1995, uh, South Africa adopted a constitution and many uh, would argue that this uh, constitution, the supreme law of the country, uh, actually assisted, and also the deal that was brokered at the time, assisted in averting and, uh, a, a revolution in South Africa. So this constitution contains uh, 27 uh, individual uh, fundamental human rights, and there's absolutely no doubt that in uh, the cases that will be upcoming uh, in our labor courts, uh, in the high courts and the higher divisions, there is no doubt in our minds that uh, the constitution will be relied on in determining whether it is uh, acceptable for companies like Discovery Health and uh, also for uh, University of Cape Town to implement a compulsory a vaccine policy at their workplaces. Now, just uh, um, wading through all of the, the different individual rights of the Constitution, not all of them are individual, but uh, the ones that are re relevant for the moment, they, they certainly are, because we also have, for example, the right to strike and also the right to engage in collective bargaining, also included in the Constitution. Um, but the, the, the most significant ones would be the one covered in section 12, which has got quite a broad one, the right to bodily integrity. And this one, uh, uh, the, uh, this right uh, protects and enshrines the security and control over one's own body and not to be subjected to medical experiments without permission. And uh, we think that this the right was included in the uh, Constitution due especially to some of the violations that occurred uh, and bodily harm that was caused to, to some individuals in the years before the introduction of our Constitution. And then the other one also closely related, uh, also in a, a, a society where uh, we initially had a minority uh, um, government who govern society and people were not always at that stage at liberty to have the right to freedom of conscience, the right to, uh, to uh, freedom of religion, thought, belief and opinion. So those are the main ones that will come into play uh, in the consideration when the first courts, uh, court cases go uh, to uh, appear before our courts. Now, <clears throat> in my view, there is um, <clears throat> no doubt that compulsory vac vaccination, um, if the government would have implemented a, such a, a compulsory system, or even employers like the ones that I've mentioned, um, will infringe some of these individual rights. However, the Constitution does go further and has actually been covered in our debate up to now. It recognizes explicitly that none of the constitutional rights are absolute. A right can be circumscribed if there is a compelling public interest in limiting it. So there can be no better example to our students in explaining how this interplay between individual rights and also collective rights or public interest how those need to be weighed up with each other. 
And the constitution, in our instance, quite uh, luckily, also uh, spells out how these, uh, this weighing up needs uh, to be done. And what is important in section 36 of the constitution, it says, uh, first of all, asks, does the purpose of the, li uh, uh, of the limitation, namely a good public health, does that outweigh the interests protected by the individual rights, namely that of bodily uh, integrity and religious beliefs? And then going further, if so, if in other words the public health does trump or override the individual right of bodily integrity, is this the least restrictive means to achieve it? So there's quite a big burden um, on those employers to look whether all other measures that are less restrictive, whether they have been implemented to achieve the purpose. Then another question that is posed is, what do other open and democratic societies do under certain circumstances, similar circumstances? Now, should we, we analyze all of this, um, then uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, suggest the following. First of all, well, the purpose, uh, we've got very good reason for placing some limitations at least on society. Um, and those would, of course, be uh, to protect uh, citizens against death, and also against serious infection, because what we have found, like many other countries of the world, when we are experiencing a wave, uh, like our fourth wave is definitely coming, then our intensive care units fill up to the extent that many other people who need quite urgent um, medical attention cannot be taken up into the hospitals, and they then they also uh, unfortunately perish because uh, they can't uh, get access to, to health care. Just on the point of the comparative inquiry, and uh, I may be criticized for look, looking into uh, the situation of, of the United States of America, because of course uh, everything that they do, uh, do is, uh, is not uh, separated from, uh, from criticism. But should we have a look at, at uh, the situation in the United States of America, uh, their uh, Supreme Court, and that would be similar to our uh, Constitutional Court, um, as over a century, despite re the rights to religious belief, held that vaccinations for smallpox, for example, to enter public schools, are constitutional, uh, constitutionally valid on strong public health grounds. All 50 states of the, the USA, including the District of Columbia, have established vaccination laws for public schools. The USA state of Washington has also now issued, issued a vaccine proclamation requiring state and private health care workers to be vaccinated. So it does seem that in at least some other democratic countries of the world, um, it is acceptable under certain circumstances to compel vaccination. Then on the less restrictive grounds, well, I must say that we've been in a three-week initial very, very hard lockdown. Everybody stayed at home like many other countries of the world. Everything came to a halt. Subsequent to that, uh, measures were introduced like uh, the wearing of masks, washing of hands, and, and, and so forth. So those measures have been implemented, but thus far, um, it has those measures have not seemed to, uh, to to really limit the death rate and so forth. Then, proportionally, um, I do think that somehow, uh, without making a blanket pronouncement on it. Uh, there could be arguments at least, and some of them quite good arguments at least, that on proportionality, that uh, there could be sound uh, reasons for limiting the individual uh, rights um, of, uh, of saying, well, you must uh, take the vaccine. 
Turning to case law, we have not had any cases reported thus far on the COVID uh, issue and compulsory vaccinations. There is, however, uh, a court case that dealt with uh, 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 tuberculosis uh, or TB vaccinations. And in uh, this, uh, the, uh, the Goliath case reported in 2009, there was an instance where um, some individuals were diagnosed with a very serious uh, uh, strain of TB and they were uh, ordered uh, to remain in isolation in the Brooklyn Chest Hospital and uh, they challenged this and they said, but we need our freedom, like in France, liberty, we need to be able to get out there. But in this instance, the court did hold that uh, those people with that serious strain of TB could infect the rest of society in their communities. It was not easy for them to socially distance in their instances, and the court said that that limitation on their individual rights, at least, that those were justifiable. Turning to our other uh, legislation, um, that we have in place. We've got the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And this requires that every employer shall provide and maintain as far as is reasonably practical a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of his employees. So employers can actually uh, get into difficulty if they transgress this legislation. And here we can see this interplay between occupational health and safety um, when obligation is placed on employers uh, that is actually prompting some of the big employers to say well we may be contravening some legislation if we don't actively take steps by doing the best that we can at this stage they need to order our employees to engage in uh, uh, back vaccines now, it, the Act continues to say that where employees interact with the public, the employer must, it's, it's not may, it, they must take reasonable measures to ensure that the interface does not endanger the health and safety of the public. Now, in terms of this Act, the Minister of Labour has, on the 11th of June this year, uh, published a consolidated amended direction. They call them directions in terms of this Act. And it says quite a, a bit about uh, vaccines and also COVID at the workplace. First of all, it, did, it, it, it contains, of course, uh, measures about screening, the wearing of PPE, improved ventilation. It spells all of that out. But then um, added to that, uh, it also says something about uh, the issue of, of vaccines, and this is, is quite interesting to us. Um, when uh, this directive was published on the 11th of June, all employers were ordered within 20 days, uh, 21 days to undertake a risk assessment. So they've got to comb through every workplace and assess exactly um, what the situation at their workplace is. Now, each such employer must then um, also mention in their uh, plan whether any of the employees must go for a vaccination. In other words, whether it will be mandatory. And then, um, the, in this plan, it must indicate uh, each of the employers um, which of the employees at the workplace um, is of high risk and which ones must go for for the vaccine so uh, the employer must in setting up this plan consider and also take into account the rights to bodily integrity and the right to religion so uh, this directive doesn't really solve the problem but it does imply that employers may in fact um, uh, compel workers to take the vaccine, but only after a proper evaluation has been done. The fun you've got. Uh, the, the fun you've got. A few minutes left. Sorry. Okay, now so I'm I'm uh, concluding at the moment. So, 
<clears throat> the answer is in fact yes. Employers may uh, vaccinate, but there are a number of hurdles. Uh, every employer will have to consider each individual case. If you have a look at the university, I think it could be argued that the people who work in the admin office and who has face-to-face -face contact with uh, uh, the, uh, the public could be compelled, but not lecturers where we have uh, means such as, for example, uh, a Zoom meetings that we are using at the moment. One big remaining question, we don't know quite yet, but it is still up for debate whether UCT and Discovery Health will either have to dismiss on grounds of misconduct, operational grounds or possibly incapacity should the point come where some of their employees uh, do not vaccinate and they want to compel them to do so through dismissals. Thank you everybody and looking forward to, to any questions that may, be, that may come up. Yeah, Stefan, if I can take the opportunity, I've got one question. Um, it's standard in all businesses, if you go to a business in a shopping centre and even here at the university, um, right of admission reserved. That the proprietor of a business can decide who he wants to admit into his uh, premises. The restaurant owner says, I don't want to admit that person who appears to be under the influence, etc., etc. Doesn't that right extinct to an employee deciding, I will not allow an employee onto my premises if he or she is not vaccinated? Right of admission reserved. Yes, Paul, I think exactly this is what will happen is you will find some employees who are being excluded on that ground to challenge it. Mm -hmm. They will typically apply for an interdict to say, or, or a, 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 an order of the court uh, to say, I want the court to order the employer to give me that access. And uh, then I think it will all fall back on these exact weighing up proportionality. I'm sure arguments will be raised by the employer and say, but if the person comes in, uh, I'm not adhering to Section 8 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Other people will be in, uh, infected. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the, the hard work will be on the employer the to be able to justify in excluding all workers. I think there the employer will fail. We'll have but there may be single ones that where it could be justified. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I think, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are listening in, etc., you realize that there's so many different angles that one can have a look at this that it's almost impossible to try and to get it in 20 minutes. But, Stefan, once again, thank you very, very much. Um, it, it brings us to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Rene Heiser. Just a little bit, Rene is a commissioner at the CCMA, which is the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration. And the reason why I specifically asked her is, in South Africa, the CCMA is a statutory dispute resolution body for all labor disputes. So 90% of all labor disputes in South Africa between employers and employees go to the CCMA. They've got offices all over the country, and I think they must face very specific challenges. So I've asked Renee to speak to us. Uh, Renee is a CCMA commissioner. She's also a panelist at MIPCO, which is the Motor Industry Bargaining Council or Dispute Resolution Center, and also a panelist for the National Bargaining Council of the Chemical Industry, as well as a panelist for the Educational Labor Relations Council of South Africa. Renee, thank you very much for your willingness to share your views with us. Thank you very much. Over to you, Renee. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are. All right, I'm going to, I have a, a slideshow that I'm going to share. Um, let's see if it's on. <coughs> Your IT guy must help. <laughs> <laughs> Just hold on. There we ah, go. There we go. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, there we are. Let's see. All right. Um, 
Right, as um, Paul has indicated, the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration is the one body in South Africa that hears all kinds of labour disputes. That means individual, collective, all um, employment disputes. In other words, they hear where there's no bargaining council that has jurisdiction, like the motor industry or the chemical um, industry, if there's no bargaining council, then these disputes are referred to the CCMA. I wanted to just very briefly on this slide um, indicate the vision, mission and strategic goal of the CCMA. Now, I'm only going to run to or skip to the mission of the CCMA and we'll see there that in the mission of the CCMA, it alludes to giving effect to everyone's constitutional rights and freedoms. I think today's discussion, as I've listened from the onset, had a lot to do with fundamental human rights. And the question that arises when it comes to mandatory vaccination is obviously to what extent are we limiting, if we are limiting one's fundamental constitutional rights. The CCMA, obviously because of the position they have in South Africa, and because of their mission and their strategic goal, is the one body, I believe, that most employers will look at when it comes to whether to have a mandatory policy or a voluntary policy insofar as vaccination is concerned. If you are interested, I have put um, onto this slide a link to a document which um, I think is an 80 or 80 or 90 page document insofar as the actual um, strategy of the CCMA is concerned, the strategic goal. Moving to the next slide, I've also just included here the value system of the CCMA. I think it's important because when we come to the CCMA's vaccination drive, it was very clear to me that the CCMA went back to their value system and they wanted to make sure that whatever their responses to the coronavirus pandemic is, and in particular when it comes to vaccination, that they allude to their value system and they reflect their value system in the drive insofar as vaccination is concerned. Moving to the next slide, Paul has indicated that we have a number of offices all around the country. Clearly, we work with the public on a daily basis. I've included in this slide, a picture of where these um, offices are, and this particular picture of our country where you can see the offices also is a slide or a picture that is issued on a weekly basis for all um, users of the CCMA and all staff members and part-time commissioners. It is quite sobering insofar as the CCMA and its operations are concerned, that on a weekly basis, they will update us as commissioners and our users of where COVID or where the virus is moving insofar as our offices are concerned. Remember, these are public offices. Necessarily, these offices, because it's a very accessible system, we have an open door policy. Anyone can walk from the street into our office and refer a matter. So we work with the public and we are talking about huge numbers here, especially our big offices in Johannesburg and um, Tuani, for example. I've included on this slide, um, if you look at media release March 2020 and a, a media release that was made um, in July 2020, if you go onto those documents or those media releases, you will see that from the onset, remember March, we had the hard lockdown in South Africa. What happened there was, as was the case, and Stefan mentioned it, everybody in South Africa went into a hard lockdown. For the CCMA in particular, it was an absolute lockdown insofar as our operations were concerned. Also what happened was, and this hasn't changed, a person no longer, an applicant employee, for example, can no longer simply walk from the street 
into an office, one of those eight offices around the country, and refer a matter. We have made provision insofar as referring matters are concerned and hearing matters or um, arbitrations and conciliations to do it online. Obviously, from an operational point of view, it remains problematic because a large sex section of our community still does not have access to online facilities or um, computerized facilities. But hopefully, in the near future, if we do get through the fourth wave, that situation might change. Um, moving to the next slide, just very briefly, the, I think if I st take one step back, and I think Beryl, our previous um, speaker this morning, also mentioned this. You know, um, I think it's a, a huge mistake to think about a vaccination program or directive in isolation. I think one has to go two steps back and you have to have some kind of interface between your overall pandemic response, COVID response, and then your vaccination response. In the case of the CCMA, if you look at the main features of how the CCMA has altered its operations, you have to, together with altering your operational um, programs and facilities and the way you work, together with that kind of response, you have to then derive an appropriate um, vaccination drive. And this is exactly what the CCMA did. The CCMA does not have any kind of mandatory vaccination drive. It is all completely voluntary. But if you look at the overall COVID pandemic response of the CCMA, it has changed the way it operates significantly. In some cases, um, parties um, um, can elect even to have their cases heard at a completely different premises, which is more appropriate when we are facing a pandemic where you want to lessen the number of people in one boardroom, in one court, in one facility. So we've made provision to have arbitrations heard at employer premises, as you can see on this particular slide. We've made provision, obviously, to um, hear cases digitally or um, online, and that has been ongoing since March 2020. And even today, parties have that option and we actually want parties to use the alternative options as opposed to coming to our offices. Moving to, just um, lastly, uh, coming to the COVID vaccine response of the um, CCMA, I've already indicated that it is completely voluntary. I've also indicated that it has to interact and it does, in the case of the CCMA, interact with um, the overall COVID response. Also, in the case of the CCMA, and I think this is a very good lesson um, to be learned, is that if you have a voluntary um, vaccine drive, information sharing and transparency is of the utmost importance. You, that picture that I have on this slide is also information that is sent to all our users and in particular our staff insofar as our vaccination drive is concerned and you can see it's on a weekly basis. So on a weekly basis the CCMA tells everybody within the CCMA how many people have already been vaccinated and that has been ongoing ever since we had vaccines available. I think that as I've mentioned, it's a good lesson to be learned. If you want to promote voluntary vaccination, information sharing is of the utmost importance. Um, I want to also um, mention very quickly, so far as the vaccine drive of the CCMA is concerned, they even go as far as to um, motivate people who have been vaccinated within the CCMA like our colleagues, the commissioners, the translators, the interpreters, the 
CM, uh, the students you've been vaccinated. You can send your picture of your vaccination, whatever the case may be, to our offices, national offices. And by that, we also um, focus more on the goal of herd community. I want to close off with a video that um, our director made when he got his jab. Um, in this video, it's a very short video, it's about two and a half minutes, I think. And this video quite clearly indicates that from the top to the bottom, if you want to have, as opposed to a mandatory vaccination process, if you want to go for a voluntary uh, vaccination process, it is a culture that you have to install from the top to the bottom in any organization. Clearly, if you look at the previous time, our statistics, it is working in the CCMA. All my colleagues that I know of, commissioners, have all been vaccinated. Um, and you can um, see when the director, in this video, you can see how the director translates this um, voluntary vaccination drive insofar as our operation is concerned. Thank you, guys. I'll, I'll be back after the video for questions. Let's hope it works. I think it will. My PC is a little bit slow. Don't <laughs> worry, I've got my tech guy here. <laughs> here we go. It doesn't look like it, Renee. Just hold on. Okay, here it comes. particularly with the stakeholders that interact directly and indirectly with the CCMA family. Kenako, the girlfriend, let's, let's vaccinate. I'm doing it today as a leader uh, to show that I must lead, uh, uh, you know, by example, uh, to take this vaccination, and that is exactly what I'm doing now, by taking the vaccination. And I encourage every one of us, and those that are listening, those that are watching this, that let's do vaccination and protect ourselves against the, the COVID-19. And that's the only way we can do it. I'm done with my vaccination. I'm feeling okay. I had time with Andrew Nett, who was assisting me. And the process has been very smooth, especially with discovery. It's very complicated. But everyone helped me every step of the way until we get here. Every staff member who is doing that is doing it. Now is when you wait for 15 minutes after taking the jab so that those that have any symptoms or side effects or complications then they can be assisted. So, so far, I am nothing, I'm feeling nothing, and I'm fine. So, after 15 minutes, I'm done and I'm So, it's so, 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 so I'm still alive, I'm still okay. So we're, we're encouraging everybody to, to continue to vaccinate, both at the CCMA family and also our stakeholders. 
uh, to continue to grow and do vaccination. This is a serious government problem which is intended to protect us, to keep us safe. So let's do it and let's keep safe. If we get the whole country vaccinated, I'm sure we'll stop worrying about the adjusted levels, whatever the plane, whatever the plane, and be like other countries. So welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renee. I've got um, one question. I'm sure that if the first disputes are referred regarding whether it's discovery of University of Cape Town, it will first end up at the CCMA before it goes to the Labour Court. Just a quick question, if I may, not really related. Uh, we all know that we are in level one of lockdown now. So in theory, we're basically open. 500 people indoors, 2,000 outdoors. Uh, the scenario, you've got a contract of employment with your employer. Your contract of employment stipulates you are employed and your place of work is Northwest University, example, Hoffman Street, etc. And now you say, I don't want to work. Is that breach of contract? Definitely. You need to go to work. All right. Now, that was just interesting. We, yeah, we're in level one. Just um, on the other um, side of the coin, you said that um, um, disputes in relation to vaccines and COVID-related protocol and that. We have actually had a couple of disputes already, if, if, especially insofar as um, non-compliance with um, COVID protocol. Um, meaning that where, for example, you go to your workplace and they want to take your temperature before you can have access to the workplace, an employee simply refuses to, to have his temperature taken for whatever reason. Um, in such a case, um, I've actually just dealt with one in the motor industry last week. A person was in actual fact dismissed for um, having done so. Um, there was a dis some kind of argument between her and the security guard and she simply walked through without having um, had her temperature taken and she was dismissed for that mm, only, okay. exclusively. And um, our feeling is that that is the correct way to go. It is misconduct, it is simply a policy of the company, you don't buy by the policy, you, you are obviously committing some kind of offence. Okay. I think if one keeps on with that strict kind of protocol as well, as I've mentioned, I don't think a vaccination um, drive can be seen in isolation. If you have a strict COVID response protocol on your premises as an employer, then after that you can start um, creating or compiling a vaccination program which suits that kind of industry sector, workplace and the operational methods you are using insofar as social distancing, etc. is concerned. Okay. Uh, but we are dealing with those systems already. Okay. Renee, thank you very, very much for your interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, and all the best to you and the work that you do at the CCMA. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Martin gruber Rissak from Austria. Uh, Vihanna, uh, are you online, Martin? Uh, Yes, but oh. I exchanged my slot with Guy. Good luck. Okay, so it's Guy going to speak. So now. we will have Israel first and then Austria as the last. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have Professor Guy Mundlak. He's professor in labor law and labor studies at the Buchan Buchmann Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University in Israel. And we all know that Israel at one stage had the highest vaccination rate in the world. So Guy, thank you very much for your willingness to share your experiences and the scenario that you have in Israel with us. Professor Guy Muntlak from Tel Aviv University in Israel. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks Paul for putting us together. And you get Israel, so that's the crazy part first. And Austria, that is the well-ordered and civilized <laughs> but, you know, and all is fine. So yes, Israel used to have the highest rate of vaccinations, I think no longer so, but it was at the forefront of um, the vaccination drive, and, and actually uh, 
quite a large part of the population now is already after the booster, after the third shot. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's interesting that there are a lot of angles on how to look at the situation, but I also see at this stage, after a few speakers, that there are also recurring themes. And actually, I think consolidation around some uh, principal ideas that re-emerge in the different countries. So I actually see an interesting convergence here. And the first, the questions in COVID of the first months of the pandemic were very different than the ones that emerged after the vaccine vaccination started. In Israel, we started the vaccinations in December 2020, and and therefore in. Questions about a compulsory vaccination, a questions about vaccination and work, arrive a couple of months later as a growing segment of the population and got vaccinated and these vaccinations became readily available to everyone. Now, the major question that we're put on the table is, can an employer demand information regarding vaccination status? Can an employer demand vaccination? And what are the implications of workers who are unvaccinated? Now, the general policy in Israel from day one until today is that the state does not mandate any vaccinations. It can encourage vaccinations, and, and we'll talk about the incentives later, but that mandating is not permitted. And, and as we will see, that's also the policy that employers cannot mandate it as such. But the industrial relations positions on this question um, vary. And, and this debate started around February 2021. And there were a few legal advisors around. And the position that business, the employers associations adopted was and to grant managers a very broad reading of the managerial prerogative and allowing the, each employer to determine her uh, policy regarding um, what to do with unvaccinated workers, including the possibility of dismissals, although with stating the principle of proportionality. So the principle of proportionality reappears from day one in this debate. Trade unions pretty much follow business and displayed support for the business view, but were more cautious on the issue of dismissals, stating that proportionality requires that dismissals is only a strategy of last resort. And then there were a few human rights organizations, including the largest association of civil rights in Israel, that pointed out um, that uh, Hurting workers in terms of them losing their jobs is a, a violation of their personal liberties, which includes the right not to get vaccinated, particularly when the state determined that vaccinations are not mandated by the state itself. And so where does the state in oil in this process in the early months of 2021, and actually probably until September 2021, as I said, vaccinations cannot be mandated. The state thinks it is legitimate and just to differentiate between vaccinated and those who are not on various respects. And in terms of workplace policies, the state is working on it. And basically, they're still working on it. We'll see in the last slide where did they get to. But uh, the fact that the state was slow in uh, setting the rules meant that the hot potato was turned over to the labor court. Mm. Now, just as the first cases were coming to the labor courts in the beginning, beginning mid-March of 2021, um, the labor law professors in Israel uh, coalesced together uh, to write an op-ed um, about, the, about what should be the policy, particularly because there was a, a sense that uh, those who are not being, who decided not to get vaccinated 
are being uh, viewed as the public enemy. Now, we have various opinions about that, and some of us actually think that they are public enemy, but still putting that aside, there is the question of what should the law be in terms of this, and we set out together a few principles. First of all, there is a right to work, and it's one thing to tell someone who's not been vaccinated and they cannot go to the cinema, and it's another thing to deny people um, the right to work, particularly in times where economic situation is very difficult after a series of closures and lockdowns. There is recognition of the managerial prerogative. And this is not a radical statement about workers can do whatever they want, but the managerial prerogative, part of it is to take care of both groups. A, to care for the health and safety of all workers, and these to respect different opinions and different views of the workers. There is a concern with discrimination for people who cannot get uh, vaccinated for medical reasons, and the extent that the, they should be covered and protected by the law on people with, civil, with disabilities. And there is a question of uh, social economic inequality because we see that there is lesser vaccination rate uh, among the lower class, among the lower social classes. So these were the interests, and what we proposed is again to put proportionality in the center. But there are a few principles. First of all, is the question of legitimate purpose, and there is a difference between um, using uh, sanctions in the workplace for inc incentivizing people to get vaccinated, and between protecting the health of other workers or consumers or pupils or students and the like. So these are two different kind of interests and measures should be taken for the latter and not for the former. Relevance, only if it's relevant to the job. There is a difference between a teacher working with students and between and someone working in a back office by herself or working from home. The question of proportionality, it's states that the employer must seek alternative means. For example, can the worker be employed at home? Can they be put in a different office? Can they be sent to be on leave with pay or without pay? The dismissal should be a matter of last resort. And of course, encouraging social dialogue. And that's a meaning involving the trade unions um, in this uh, process of negotiating solutions for workplaces. And that would be both at the level of the state, meaning at peak level bargaining, and both at the level of the shop floor at enterprise bargaining. Cases arrived to court starting around March 10th. By now we have about a dozen cases. Some of them have already been appealed at the National Labor Court. All of them are still at the level of temporary injunctions. And, but I think we get a very clear sense of where the court is heading. And generally, the court is heading exactly towards putting proportionality at the center. And I think that a lot of the cases did not really um, provide a serious challenge uh, to this question. Because the cases that came up before the labor court were of employers who stated that they require the employees to be vaccinated or to do a PCR test within 70 hours uh, before they come to work. So there was an alternative. Um, a special ed teacher who works with children in special education who were, of course, not immunized, um, and she refused to do the PCR test, was sent to leave without pay. A cashier in a food retail company saying she refused to do the PCR was sent home on a leave without pay, and the employer was urged to try and find a temporary solution, although it's very limited because what the ship is doing in the supermarket is not something that can be done from a back office or to be done from home. In municipalities, it was a social worker working with families, a yoga instructor, back office worker. All the situations were similar. There was one case, and that's the National Lottery, where they um, pretty much told the worker that if she doesn't get vaccinated, then she's being uh, dismissed. And that was a flat.
flat refusal to employ her unless she gets vaccinated. And that was the only case in which the court um, ordered reinstatement of that worker, uh, telling the employer that flat refusal is not an option and that they should consider alternative measures. Uh, in the second round, after they offered her to do a PCR test and also placed her in a adjacent building in a separate office, she appealed again in <laughs> the employer's policy, and this time the court of that. <laughs> the lesson that we learned here is quite clear, and it pretty much resonates with the principles that we lay out mm. in the op-ed, um, and that's uh, to view what are the rationales um, and to consider what uh, proportionate measures are out there. When we look at the judicial concerns, first there is a concern with a uh, contact with unvaccinated, maybe school children, or maybe the social worker who works with families uh, in situation of poverty. And there were questions about whether there are protective measures, whether the worker is sitting behind prospect shields and the like. And the courts uh, referred often when it was relevant and applicable to the position of the trade union and of the workers' committees and the fact that they upheld the measures the employer took and looked for the range of alternatives for work in isolation. One question that came up in June and is currently not resolved is the medical question. How much do we know about whether unvaccinated people are putting vaccinated workers at risk or whether the fact that they're coming to work with their vaccinated colleagues, the risk is mostly their own? And a judge said, I think it was in July, that at this stage when medical data about the risk to the vaccinated is unknown, the court will not rely on one opinion or another. So this remains an open question. Mm. Where do the trade unions stand on this? And here a short study of uh, responses of workers' committees, of the uh, workers' representatives at the enterprise level, I think demonstrates that Generally, they are in alliance with the employer. Generally, they're voicing um, the idea that um, workers should get vaccinated and that it is okay for employers to take measures and to ascertain that the workers uh, are vaccinated or coming to work after doing a PCR test and for protecting the vaccinated uh, workers. But you see that they feel ambivalent about their role. So one mm. says, why do I need this shit? <laughs> and deal with the problems and with problem cases. But it's a headache because they feel that they are torn between different groups of workers who are trying to pull them towards their position. And one said, I go along with management on this. You know, In a sense, it's easier for me to say this is what management determined and I'm not going to challenge this. Um, some admit that if they are really essential workers and there is a problem, they just turn their head because they need these workers and they're not going to make a big fight out, out of it. One said, I felt like a mediator between two groups, and it's for me, it's an important mission, so there is some kind of a personal satisfaction. But I think all in all, what we see is a very compromising, mediating position and one, and one that clearly doesn't challenge the idea that uh, workers should come to the workplace either vaccinated or uh, after a PCR test. And I think that that's pretty much the status quo. Mm. Okay? We do not mandate vaccination, but it is legit to ask uh, workers to be tested. And so where is the state in this? Uh, trying to wake up. Israel politics is not very simple. And first of all, the general policy of the new government, it's a government now in position for the last four months, is to open the economy as much as possible. And that means we have a very high rate of vaccinations. We also have a very high rate of people tested positive. And looking at the rate of uh, positives per million uh, people, Israel is ranked very high, and the idea is um, 
just to live with it. Here at the university, we're starting to teach this week uh, in class with compulsory attendance. Mm. Um, in September 2021, um, they issued bylaws uh, stating that in certain workplaces, public workplaces where uh, you have to work with the public or with children or at universities and the like, um, the employer should require proof of vaccination or PCR tests. So that's the first time the state mandated employers to uh, require that from the employers. And what they're working on now, and I think this will be a tilt in the spectrum of proportionality, that's on a holding that people who were dismissed from work because they refused to get vaccinated or do a PCR test will be denied unemployment funds. Mm. And this is a game changer. Yeah. Because this now is not about protecting public health. This is about serious economic sanctions. And there is a lot of resistance uh, regarding this law. And we have to wait and see uh, probably in the next couple of weeks we'll know where this is going to. So I think this is pretty much a timeline of what's happening here. Uh, thank you, Guy. That was very, very interesting. Um, just a quick question from my side. Um, and the so-called health pass that they talk about in France and in Israel, is that also required in Israel if you want to visit a restaurant or a museum that you must show you've been vaccinated? Yeah, for, in terms of consumers, um, you know, going to restaurants, going to the cinema and the like, you have to show that you've been vaccinated or recovered or did a PCR test. Okay. And that was the easy, and, and this is, the, and for example, there, there was one student here at our university that went to court challenging that why the students have to show that they've been vaccinated and the faculty does not. And this has been changed a few weeks ago when for the first time they mandated some employers in some sectors um, to demand vaccination. So it's the first time that it's not simply left to the managerial prerogative, but also mandated by the state. Okay, oh, thank, thank you very much. Um, what is clear for me so far is that there's certain things within this COVID-19 pandemic that's international the experience is international the way people approach it is international it comes to the finer details where every country will have their own approach depending on their own unique circumstances but it really makes it um, a case for fast i just want to before i say goodbye to a uh, guy i just want to make sure if all right a uh, uh, guy professor stefan van eck has got a question for you for you stefan Hi, Guy. Thanks for your presentation. I just wanted to make sure. So, in other words, a lecturer at the university could be dismissed if uh, he or she doesn't produce a, a certificate indicating that, that they've been vaccinated. And the same also goes for the university would be justified in saying that uh, a student will not be allowed on campus and in class if, that, if they can't produce that proof. So let's start with the uh, student, that's easier. And the university denies students who have not been vaccinated or recovered or took a PCR test. I mean, there are a few options here. Mm -hmm. uh, they deny entry and they actually check at the gates of the university whether you have a certificate for one of these options. That means that on these court, we are required to make our lectures accessible either by what's called hybrid learning, meaning mm -hmm. that we also broadcast the class while we're giving the class, or to put on recordings afterwards, except for some courses, which the students have to be in, present on campus, and then they cannot register for that course. Regarding a staff, I think that a staff member who refuses to be vaccinated and refuses to do a PCR test and he is not recovered and it will be an issue here. No, he, he will not be allowed on campus and will not be allowed uh, to be here. And then you need to find proportionate 
think there are proportional alternatives. For example, can uh, that faculty member teach from home? And the answer is more and most likely would be yes, they can. Uh, I doubt uh, there is tenure say, in universities in Israel. I doubt anyone will get dismissed for that. And for the few for whose this is a principle that they're not even willing to be tested and in advance before class, there are options. And I think that in most workplaces, and they don't look to instigate a big battle, but they look to uh, find peaceful solutions and pragmatic ones. This is complicated times for everyone. And I think those who are refusing to get vaccinated, you know, I don't buy it, I don't get it. But I, I do think that in terms of industrial relations, the right thing to do is be pragmatic about it rather than go to court and rather than uh, take steps. And I doubt any university will do something like that. Mm. Thanks for that. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. That was really fascinating. Thanks for the question, Stefan. I just want to make our next speaker is to be Professor Attila Kun. He's from Hungary. He said he might join. He's got a class, so he's running from one class to another. I just want to see if Professor Kun is up already. Yes, I'm here, Paul. Ah, oh, thank you very much, Attila. I'm happy that you've joined us and that you could run from one class to another. It just shows us that at least you're working in Hungary. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Professor Attila Kun. He's Associate Professor in Labor Law and Head of the Department of Labor Law and Social Security in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, I've also met Attila a couple of years ago and we've also become good friends since then. So Attila, we're looking forward to your experiences, how things are going in Hungary with regards to COVID-19 and vaccines. Thank you, Attila. Thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction and especially for the invitation. Of course, it's needless to say that it's a great pleasure for me to uh, share the online stage with all of you and to meet at least uh, online. Um, and uh, sorry that I couldn't be here for the whole uh, conference. I was here in the morning, I heard Beryl and uh, the first speaker, but after I had to leave for teaching, but uh, I just arrived back during Guy's presentation. And um, again, uh, thank you very much. And let me give you a very short uh, presentation about the related Hungarian situation. As the colleagues, uh, especially better in the morning, uh, were focusing on the general constitutional human rights background of the topic. I won't deal with this part of the issue. I will mostly and uh, narrowly uh, concentrate on the Hungarian uh, situation. As an introduction, I would like to say that uh, in Hungary, just to make it clear, there is no general obligation for vaccination in the world of work. Of course, as everywhere, we have a very sensitive, fierce, ongoing political debate. But uh, you have to know that uh, we will have parliamentary elect elections in springtime in April 2022, which is quite close, less than half a year. And we have a very tense political climate uh, in Hungary um, between the governing party and the opposition, which is usual. Uh, so I would say that uh, it is really not probable uh, that the government, the current government would risk uh, for political reasons any kind of decision uh, in that regard. Uh, so if I would need to guess, I would say that uh, it is uh, a very sensitive, very socially dividing topic. So I don't think that the government uh, will uh, risk in the coming six or seven months before the elections any, any concrete um, uh, steps uh, in this regard. But uh, there is one uh, sectoral exception in Hungary, which uh, uh, relates to healthcare workers. So in the healthcare uh, sector, we have mandatory uh, vaccination. It was decided uh, during the summertime with the government decree, which is already a point of discussion because it was decided by a government decree, not by uh, 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 an act of the parliament. So the level of uh, uh, hierarchy uh, in the legal system can be already a question. So uh, many uh, constitutional lawyers are adopting that uh, this kind of a strong obligation can be really carried out by a simple government decree instead of an uh, act of a parliament. So this is just a formal question, but uh, it was introduced uh, 
during summer, and there was a deadline uh, for vaccination for the healthcare staff. I mean healthcare in a broad sense, so not only the doctors, but uh, nurses and uh, all related personnel, uh, concretely defined in this degree, degree, are obliged to take the vaccine. And the deadline for vaccination was prolonged, uh, I think, one or two times. And finally, uh, it was set for 15th of September. So just um, two weeks ago, uh, it has expired. And of course, there is a big debate about this, because only those employees are exempted uh, from this obligation who are medically contraindicated uh, for vaccination. But all other medical uh, healthcare workers should uh, take the vaccination. And uh, maybe not uh, the very issue of the obligation is the biggest problem in Hungary and the biggest debate in Hungary, but the legal consequences, because in case of non-compliance with this obligation for vaccination, the employer can and should also in some uh, situations terminate the employment relationship without notice, with immediate effect, and what is even more important, without severance pay. There is a 15 days waiting period uh, before uh, exercising the termination, but it is a very uh, clear and strong uh, legal consequence for not being uh, vaccinated in the healthcare sector. Of course, we have hundreds, uh, I'm really saying hundreds, more than 200 uh, 100, uh, related constitutional, individual constitutional complaints. We have this in Hungary, so it is possible to go to the constitutional court with individual constitutional complaints. And we have hundreds of uh, them. Uh, they are still pending. So, of course, it will be very interesting to see the constitutional court's uh, co decision on these uh, matters. Uh, they are tackled in a fast-track procedure, but still they are pending. Uh, they are expected to be issued in the coming one or two weeks, hopefully. And the biggest legal problem here is not really about the obligation, the pure obligation for vaccination, but as I said, about the legal consequences, the proportionality of the legal consequences. I mean, the termination without uh, notice. This is the biggest uh, um, debated issue. And uh, what is even more problematic in a Hungarian sense, the non-payment of severance pay uh, in such cases of termination, because uh, the constitutional approach to the severance pay in Hungary is based on the property right um, analogy. Uh, so on the basis of that, the severance pay can only be taken away when there is a serious misconduct on the side uh, of the employee. And of course, in this situation, it is uh, up to debate whether it's a serious misconduct or not uh, to take the vaccination or not. So it will be interesting to see what uh, the Constitutional Court uh, will say in this regard. Of course, the government has a very clear opinion on this. The government is saying that the protection and guarantee of the right to life and health is reflected in the imposition of the vaccination obligation. So this is the only uh, sector where it is mandatory now to have the vaccine. If we are going uh, a little bit on a more general and more theoretical level, of course, uh, practically speaking, we have to make a distinction. Uh, if the mandatory vaccination is based on the employer's order, theoretically speaking, which is a labor law issue, or it is based on law, which is more like a public law issue for me and for us in Hungary, let me deal with the more labor law inclined topic. So what's the situation, what is the legal situation in Hungary when the obligation for vaccination would be uh, based on the employer's autonomous uh, decision or, or order? Uh, in Hungary, most of the labor lawyers and most of the labor law scholars and the labor law doctrine uh, are saying that it could be considered as a part of the managerial prerogative for the employer to decide about the mandatory vaccination. But of course, it's not a totally autonomous decision of the employer, and it can be exercised only under very strict conditions, exceptionally, and it can be decided only on a case-by-case -case basis. But as I said, most of the labor lawyers in Hungary, of course, it's not an official formal opinion what I am expressing now, but uh, as we are talking and discussing with colleagues, both in academia and practice, uh, most of us are saying that uh, it is simply not realistic and lifelike in many 
uh, real life uh, situations for the employer not to inquire about the vaccination uh, situation of the employees. So the unofficial majority opinion uh, is the following. Uh, in general, the employer's constitutional right to data processing, I'm talking about the uh, data of the employee, whether the employee is protected against the virus or not, uh, whether he is vaccinated, he or she is vaccinated or not. Uh, so this uh, data processing uh, right of the employer is superior uh, to the employee's constitutional right to self-determination. Of course, I know it's uh, uh, fit for debate, I mean this uh, strong uh, opinion, but uh, uh, as I said, most of the labor lawyers are saying the same in Hungary. Uh, what is the legal basis for that? Uh, in labor law doctrine, as everywhere, we have, of course, the notion, the concept of uh, the condition fit for work, uh, as defined by the labor code. Of course, we all know that the employees shall appear at the place and time specified by the employer in a condition fit for work. And there are three important cornerstones here. According to Hungarian legal practice, the content of the condition uh, fit for work is always defined by the employer. Of course, there are some legislation in this regard, but it's basically defined by the employer what are the proper conditions to be fit uh, for work. Just to mention some examples, of course, the employer can say that there is no tolerance for alcohol or you should have a driving license, even if you are totally healthy to drive, but you still need a driving license uh, to drive a truck, for example. So it is up to the employer to clearly define uh, the conditions fit for work. And the question arises why vaccination could not be one element uh, in this regard. Of course, not in general, but in some sectors and in some profession, there is an argument that it could be uh, part of the concept of uh, the fit for work. And this is important but because when the employee is not in a condition fit for work, of course, it qualifies an unjustified absence. And if we are talking about an unjustified absence, surely, uh, this can entail even the non-payment uh, of wages, the suspension of wages, and even it can lead to dismissal in some specific situations. So I'm not now just catching the theoretical uh, reasoning of uh, Hungarian labor lawyers. So in theory, uh, many labor lawyers are giving the advice that in some specific situation it could be and uh, maybe even should be uh, possible for employees uh, to, to, to make it mandatory for workers to have the green pass or the vaccination. But of course, the practice is different. Not only our government is shy in this regard, but also the employers are not really exercising this uh, theoretical rights. Of course, I'm not saying that there are no uh, debates and contradictions, but uh, in theory, uh, as I said, um, uh, maybe it would be possible. Let me just uh, underpin this with some um, quotations from the Labor Code and the Labor Safety Act uh, for clarification. Um, just to be very quick with this, uh, in the Labor Code we can find some relevant, highly relevant provisions, general clauses, open norms uh, in this regard, which could be relevant when assessing uh, such a difficult uh, decision of the employer. The first one, as you can see on the slide, is about the personality rights of employees. And the Labor Code is uh, saying that um, the personality rights of employees may be restricted only in light of the well-known uh, necessity and proportionality test, uh, and only when it is necessary uh, to uh, achieve the purpose of the given employment relationship. And furthermore, it is obligatory for the employer to communicate well in advance in writing all the means and conditions for any such restriction. So again, um, the self-determination right of the employee is kind of personality right. So if I'm just reading word by word the text of the law, it would be uh, theoretically possible to, to, to restrict uh, this uh, right of the employee on the basis of the necessity and proportionality test. Secondly, the Labor Code says that the employer may require an employee to make a statement or to disclose personal data which is deemed necessary for the conclusion, fulfillment, enforcement and termination of the employment relationship. Again, this general clause, this open norm, is kind of 
uh, a basic theoretical uh, authorization for the employer uh, to ask the employee to disclose the personal data related to uh, vaccination or the green pass, uh, for example. And of course, we all know that uh, it's written also in the Hungarian Labour Code that the responsibility of the implementation of occupational safety lies with the <laughs> employers, which is again an important starting point in this regard. If we take another very quick look uh, on the Act on Labour Safety, I would like to quote two provisions of the uh, Act on Labour Safety, which could be relevant here. Of course, the Hungarian Act on Labour Safety is based on the European Framework Directive, so uh, it's not really special. But uh, we have a very progressive wording uh, in the code. If you read on the slide, employers shall take under full responsibility all steps and measures to prevent or reduce occupational risks in light of the changing circumstances. Let me emphasize again that uh, full responsibility, all steps in light of the changing circumstances. Of course, uh, globally we have <laughs> very changing circumstances because of the coronavirus pandemic and if we are talking about all steps and full responsibility, we can speculate that the employers uh, could have uh, such a right uh, to inquire about the vaccination status of the employees. Furthermore, the Act of Labour Safety states that uh, workers, of course, shall cooperate with the employer in carrying out all kinds of OSH actions, occupational safety and health actions, especially when carrying out the employer's measures for eliminating dangers. So I just quoted this uh, legal uh, paragraphs from the law because if we put them all together, uh, there is a good legal uh, reasoning uh, for labor lawyers and for employers that it would be or could be theoretically possible to ask for uh, the data related to vaccination or, or, or having the green. As I said, we Sorry. don't have a specific law on this, but what we have uh, is not a source of law, but a very important authoritative uh, decision from one national authority, and this is the National Authority for Data Protection and Freedom of Information. This is the national body uh, for the enforcement of the GDPR uh, in Hungary. And uh, several months ago, uh, the authority for data protection issued a guidance on the employer's right to information on the fact whether the worker is protected against the coronavirus or not. So it is based on the GDPR and it is not uh, uh, strictly a labor law approach to the question, but at least from the data protection side, we have something with what is written and something what is clear. And uh, there are two very important um, statements uh, in this uh, guidance that I would like to quote first. The authority is kind of um, calling for legislation, uh, kind of addressing the government, the legislator, to, to, to do something in this situation. Uh, it is said, it is written in the guidance, that it is justified and necessary for the legislator to settle this issue in a uniform and transparent manner. So this is kind of uh, a clear call uh, for uh, legislation in this regard. The second statement what I would like to quote from this guidance. Of course, it's just a soft law uh, piece of norm, uh, not a piece of legislation, but still very important in practice. And you should read carefully the second uh, statement, what is also written on my slide. Uh, the authority is saying that it may be necessary and may be proportionate um, in certain occupations or in relation to certain groups of employees for the employer to know the fact that the worker is protected against the coronavirus or not. So the authority is on the opinion uh, that uh, it can be legitimate uh, for some uh, employers in some occupations and in some uh, group of employees to ask for uh, the data uh, of vaccination or uh, not. Of course, it is emphasized by the guidance that it should be based on a careful and thorough risk analysis carried out on the basis of objective criteria for the assessment of the biological exposures to health and safety of workers. 
I know that this is again a very open and very general uh, formulation of this problem, but uh, the guidance gives some examples. Uh, for example, it says that social care workers or maintenance and the repair and fitting staff of the hospitals, so not only the medical workers, but the maintenance staff of hospitals and the uh, medical institutions could uh, fall uh, in these occupations where it would be possible for the employer to require uh, data about uh, vaccination. The guidance makes it clear that uh, it could be in the interest of the protected worker on the one hand or on the other hand uh, on the other workers who are uh, working in cooperation with the protected or uh, vaccinated worker and thirdly uh, it can be uh, in the name of the interest of the customers who may come into contact uh, with the worker and uh, the guidance also mentions the public interest which is kind of debated by the Hungarian labor community uh, because it's very difficult to say that the private employer uh, should um, serve uh, the public interest so this is not the basic starting point for us not the public interest but the private uh, managerial prerogative of the employer uh, if it is necessary and proportionate to ask for uh, the vaccination certificate of course, uh, the National Authority for Data Protection is only talking about the data protection side of the story, not about the labor law side of the story. And uh, when it comes to the legal consequences of this uh, right to information of the employer, uh, we cannot go too far. As I said, the termination and non-payment of wages uh, would be possible only in very exceptional situations. But uh, it is said in the guidance that uh, the employer would have the right to, to reorganize uh, shift <clears throat> schedules, the places of work, to carry out some work organization measures on the basis of the information about vaccination. So this is what we have now. I know it's quite theoretical, but as I said, we don't have a law and we don't have a practice of uh, employers, but we have this speculation and the legal reasoning that, uh, Again, as I said, uh, theoretically speaking, and also in the opinion of the National Authority for Data Protection, it would be possible for some employers to uh, do this. Uh, my last slide uh, uh, would be some thoughts about uh, the other side of the story. As I said, we should make a differentiation between vaccination based on the employer's decision or uh, based on law, of course. And uh, if it is based on law, in my understanding, there would be three basic preconditions in any country to have mandatory vaccination. Of course, there is a need for a medical professional consensus in this regard, which is a medical question. We lawyers cannot say too much about this, I believe. So the national health authorities should have a medical consensus. Second, there is a need for a political consensus or if not consensus, a very strong political uh, mandate and political will of the uh, actual government to carry out uh, this, uh, to, to, to issue such laws. And certainly, theoretically speaking, of course, there would be a need, a very wide, broad and thorough social dialogue. Uh, so, in my understanding, legislation would be possible under these three conditions. And we know the country examples, Italy, the Vatican State, uh, we heard a very um, good lecture about France in some sectors, but if I'm talking about the Hungarian reality, uh, maybe only the first criteria is fulfilled because uh, there is more or less a medical consensus, professional consensus, the vaccines are safe and everything. But as I said, we don't have the political consensus, we don't have the political will of the actual government now, and uh, as in most post-socialist countries in our Central and Eastern European <laughs> regions, you know that there is no um, vital social dialogues in general and uh, you can imagine that there is not uh, there is no real ongoing social dialogue on this debate which is kind of a sad story uh, so let me conclude and uh, share you maybe one uh, personal thoughts uh, to finish my uh, contribution 
I cannot say a big conclusion, uh, but uh, what we are doing in Hungary now, we are waiting for some kind of legislation because uh, without a clear legislative uh, answer or solution, um, labor lawyers and employers are only speculating and uh, not really ex experimenting even, just speculating whether it would be possible or not to ask for vaccination, but it's not really happening. So we are just, uh, I know it's very simple, but we are waiting for uh, some kind of legislation. Two personal thoughts. Uh, the first one is that, uh, as I said before, I really think that uh, we lawyers are talking a little bit too much about this because it basically should be and must be a medical uh, professional question to decide about this. And uh, the lawyers should be responsible for the implementation, not uh, for the decision, I believe. And one more last, uh, and really the last uh, personal thought of mine in this regard, that uh, I have the feeling that um, at work, uh, we are ready to accept so many inherent and implicit has hazards. Uh, I'm talking about usual uh, working life situations. So, for example, when we are just sitting 10 hours in the office, we are having a lot of stress. We have some pollution at workplaces. So I'm just saying that uh, we are routinely accepting so many inherent and natural health hazards at work. So uh, I am asking myself, um, and I don't see why we shouldn't accept something which is kind of medically proven, not uh, hazardous for our health. I'm talking about the vaccines. So I am in favor of uh, uh, the right of the employer uh, for mandatory vaccination, of course, not in general, but uh, in some exceptional and special situations in light of the necessity and proportionality test, as I said before. But again, I don't see why we uh, shouldn't accept uh, the obligation mandated by the uh, employer if it is well uh, underpinned and well reasoned. Uh, thank you very much. And that was my part. Thank you very much, uh, Attila. It was fascinating to see once again the different approaches, the different things that different countries have done. And you've actually summarized it very, very well. If our labor law specialists, if we get around the table and we're 20, we will have 20 opinions. At this stage, we're all speculating. And that's why I said to you when I started with the idea of this webinar, maybe it will be great in a year's time to see what has transpired, how the courts have dealt with this in different countries, etc. So, um, Attila, thank you very, very much in your busy schedule um, for making time to address us. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Now, this gentleman has been waiting patiently. He was one of the first to sign on this morning. Uh, it's Professor Martin grieber Risak. He's Associate Professor of Labor Law and Law of Social Security, University of Vienna in Austria. And he's our last speaker or panelist for the day. So, Martin, thank you very much for your willingness to wait until this time. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope the presentation is working. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Um, I, it was a fascinating morning. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to uh, contribute. Um, I think that the Austrian example might wrap up the picture uh, quite nicely uh, because I think it's an interesting uh, addition uh, to, to the picture. Uh, what's interesting because different to the examples we had in Austria, we have rather detailed legislation on COVID-19 at the workplace. Uh, so we do not have to rely on general principles, uh, but there's actually special legislation uh, we may rely on. Um, so what uh, I would like to give you a little bit is the background um, in Austria, because in Austria we did not have compulsory vaccination since the abolition of smallpox vaccination in the 1980s. Um, and after it, there was no compulsory uh, vaccination for anything, not even in the health sector, uh, where we have a lot of uh, vaccinations that are recommended, um, but uh, they are not um, compulsory. Uh, in the end, um, 
um, this leads to a political discussion which is very much based on uh, the free decision to take the vaccination or not. And as it was pointed out, especially uh, by Attila, um, our political parties are extremely reluctant to even talk about uh, compulsory vaccination. Uh, therefore, all parties actually are of the position we will not introduce this. Um, so, um, mandated vaccination, mandated by the states, obviously is not a political option. The vaccination rate uh, in Austria is not that high. I've given you the numbers uh, of this morning. Only 64% uh, of the people living in Austria, including uh, kids, uh, are um, vaccinated with the first shot and 60% uh, have received both shots. This is considered not to be high enough uh, for um, a, a for kind of closing up everything, uh, uh, opening up everything again. So the discussion is very much on how to boost the vaccination rates and all the measures I will be talking about uh, now are uh, come in the light of um, on how to boost it, on how to motivate those people who are not vaccinated yet uh, to get vaccinated. Uh, as I mentioned, mandatory vaccination is not considered uh, an option. Um, what is actually discussed right now is something rather similar uh, to the uh, provision in Italy. Um, we have something we call the evidence of low epidemiological risk. We call it 3G, uh, which means like in German, genesen, getested or the geimpft, which means you're either recovered, you're vaccinated or tested. Um, and the discussion now is about uh, introducing um, a mandatory evidence of low epidemiological risk in some or in all workplaces. Uh, as Attila pointed out, this is done right now uh, in discussions uh, with the social partners, although the social partners have taken the decision, this is not something they can decide on. But this is a matter uh, of public policy and the social partners are here to reach an agreement of uh, differing interests between employers and employees and not in uh, doing public policy. So in a way, um, it's back uh, to the government. Uh, what's also discussed, and I will point this out uh, just in a second, Austria has introduced an extensive number of free test schemes. So you can test it, get tested everywhere. For example, in Vienna, we have a gurgle. Uh, free gurgle test. Uh, you can bring it in the morning. Uh, the gurgle you do at home. You film yourself um, in front of your uh, mobile phone. You bring it to a supermarket. It gets collected, and in the evening uh, you get your test, and it's all free of charge. So what they are discussing now also is the abolition of the free test schemes. So there will be at least, if testing is the alternative, a financial incentive to get vaccinated. If you look at it, in Austria there was never a general closure of workplaces. Even during the shutdowns, um, it was all, you were always allowed uh, to go to work, you were always allowed uh, to work in the workplace, uh, only customer contact was forbidden and shops and restaurants were closed, but the workplaces, the factories, uh, the offices were open. There was never any obligation to work from home. Uh, there was no obligation on the employer to introduce, you know, uh, home working schemes. Uh, at some point of time, masks were the measure of choice, and they still are in the legislation. Um, but this was only in shops, um, but never in the workplace itself. Uh, in the law, uh, it was always stressed that the consent of the employee was required. Um, so you couldn't even introduce an obligation to wear a mask in the workplace uh, unilaterally. Uh, Austria started quite early to uh, introduce general free testing facilities in January 2021, uh, and testing now is part of everybody's everyday life. Uh, this is especially because Austria uh, was not one of the first uh, to um, have enough vaccination for all the population. Uh, in spring 2021, when uh, vaccination uh, was getting more widespread, 
uh, and um, the government was starting to uh, vaccinate um, uh, wide uh, parts uh, of the population. Um, something was introduced like the green pass on the EU level in Austria, it's called the evidence of low epidemiological risk and it includes uh, three different um, pieces of information, either you are recovered, then you have access to everything, you are vaccinated or you are tested. Um, in the hospitality industry, like in restaurants and hotels, um, you were as a customer required to show uh, this green pass. Um, as a worker, you don't have to have the green pass, uh, you uh, can get uh, tested, but you have to get tested regularly. And an interesting um, instance is the opening of the night gastronomy, as they call it, it's clubs or bars which they open uh, in the night. Uh, you are not required to wear a mask, but you have to, uh, in Vienna now, you have to prove that you are either recovered or vaccinated. Sorry, there's a, uh, a mistake uh, on the slides. Um, but this is not applicable to workers. The workers can test themselves out. You know, if you're a waiter in a discotheque, uh, you don't have to be either recovered or vaccinated. You can get tested too, and this is argued because um, there should be a freedom of choice. And if you have to work, uh, you cannot get forced uh, into a vaccination, um, but there should be the option for testing. Schools and universities are running under a special regime um, and the health and care sector, there's still compulsory testing and the obligation uh, to wear a mask. Um, what I just want to stress, and this is something that has been stressed before, a lot of our legislation is not legislation uh, passed by <laughs> Parliament, uh, but it is um, ministerial decrees, uh, regulations passed uh, by the Ministry of Health, uh, and this is um, done on the basis of the so-called COVID-19 Measures Act. Based on the COVID-19 uh, Measures Act, uh, we have different ministerial decrees. And this is the old one um, I was uh, already mentioning. Uh, and it says, by agreement between employer and employee, stricter rules on wearing a mask may be established. So what you actually needed was an agreement um, on the obligation to wear a mask in the workplace. And of course, there was also uh, the question if employers may go beyond an obligation to wear a mask, which can only be introduced uh, by agreement. So there was the question, could they introduce mandatory testing to access the workplace uh, based on that they actually own the workplace on the managerial prerogative? Uh, which I think uh, was disputed, um, rightly disputed, because the Act only mentions the obligation to wear a mask and says that this needs to have. Uh, uh, there needs to uh, be an agreement. Um, there was also the question if employers can ask for evidence of low epidemiological risk. This was there. Can, in addition, there is a collective, uh, general collective bargaining agreement. As you might know, uh, in Austria, 95% uh, of the workplaces are covered by collective bargaining agreement. And this general collective bargaining agreement, which went into force, there were other ones uh, before on Corona measures on 1st of September. And here, interestingly, you have a measure uh, which says, if you're obliged to wear a mask, you can prove yourself out of it. If you show an evidence of low epidemiological risk, like a green pass, uh, then you don't have to wear a mask in the workplace anymore, which is an indication uh, that um, there um, is only it's only possible to introduce the obligation to wear a mask. Uh, and now we have a new uh, regulation, uh, only in force uh, since two three weeks. And here we have an interesting um, provision which says with regard to wearing a mask and the presentation of evidence of a low epidemiological risk, stricter regulations going beyond this regulation may be provided for in justified cases. Mm -hmm. And this is the basis we work with now, which 
shows on the one hand side you don't need to have the agreement with the employee anymore and there's an explicit mentioning of the evidence of low epidemiological risk. Interestingly, um, it mentions justified cases. So we have always um, now uh, an employer may order uh, either wearing a mask, but wearing a mask, uh, there's the general collective bargaining agreement. So you can get out of it when you show the green pass to your employer. Um, but this is uh, the practical um, application of it. They may uh, now ask for an evidence of low epidemiological risk. Um, interestingly, with this evidence of epidemiological risk, uh, the regulation uh, mentions that it can be done uh, with three different uh, proofs. One of them is that you have recovered uh, from uh, an infection. Second is that you are vaccinated. And third, uh, that you have been tested. Uh, still, um, the test um, is not valid that long anymore, especially for the anti-gene test, like this uh, stuff you put into your nose. Uh, it has been reduced to 24 hours. So if you want to show this test, you have to test more or less every day. <laughs> and with the PCR test, it's 72 hours. But to get the PCR test, it usually takes, if you take the free uh, testing facilities, um, you do it in the morning, you get it in the evening. So it's actually restricted uh, to two days, uh, uh, practically. So you have to test at least um, two or three times a week. The tests are still free of charge. Uh, but they may change. And there's, of course, the question who will pay for it, because if the employer requires it and it's not mandated uh, by the state, then I would argue uh, if he or she requires it and they want it, but it's not necessary um, based on the COVID-19 measures regulation, then they would have to pay for it. Um, to wrap uh, this up, um, with the question of the seminar, no vaccination, no access. What we've had, interestingly, was a rather extensive discussion on the hiring process. And even in the past, um, um, we found out that during the hiring process, you're actually not protected at all because the vaccination status is not uh, a protected criteria in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. uh, so if an employer does not employ you based on the vaccination status or on your refusal to, uh, to answer uh, a question about your vaccination uh, status, there's no legal provision uh, you can enforce either for getting the employment contract, which is not even possible if it's one of the uh, crowns mentioned uh, in the EU directives. And on the, on the other hand side, uh, there's not even a basis to get some kind of damage. In the ongoing employment relationship, um, the Austrian approach is very much like uh, Guy Mundlach uh, pointed it out. You have to have uh, some kind of um, uh, balancing of interests, of balancing of interests of the employer, why he wants to have uh, vaccination or in the Austrian context, an evidence of low epidemiological risk, which is um, testing has to be always an, an alternative uh, where there is a strong, uh, it's not even a strong argument, but it is the alternative of choice based uh, on uh, the legislation. So um, based on this, you could say in Austria, no vaccination, no access wouldn't work. Um, the only thing that might work in justified cases and the justification, maybe we can talk about it uh, in the discussion, um, but I think this is the most tricky question right now. Uh, what might be the justification? And it's usually uh, where you have a lot of customer contact. Um, and these are people that change a lot and you don't really know who they are. These are the places where you now need to wear a mask and you have customer like in a shop. Um, and we, where you have similar customer contacts, um, this might be a requirement, this might be justified. And the second issue is usually when you work with vulnerable persons, uh, persons who can either not get vaccinated like kids or people uh, due to the health reasons. 
the practical example would be you are working together in an office uh, in a room uh, with a pregnant person where it's not recommended uh, to get vaccinated and she is not vaccinated yet then this might be one of those justified cases. Mm. Uh, last but not least, on the termination, uh, we have had one decision by the Supreme Court, which is just out a couple of days now, um, on a person working in a care facility who refused uh, the mandatory testing. Uh, this is one of those facilities where you have to do uh, testing mandated by the state. Um, mm. And the mm. person said, I don't want to get tested, uh, I don't believe in it, um, and yeah. You know, all these arguments um, some people have, uh, and this was considered um, a justified ground for a dismissal. It was not a summary dismissal, it was a normal uh, dismissal. This person uh, was then given notice and it was terminated, he challenged it, uh, but in the end the courts upheld it. What was interesting that the courts really rushed this case through, uh, in a couple of months, usually it takes uh, one to two years uh, in Austria, so obviously jurisprudence was trying to help uh, in a way to clear up at least these questions, which I would say uh, uh, was cr crystal clear to employment lawyers, because if you are not allowed to access a workplace without being tested uh, based on state legislation, then the employer has to enforce it. Uh, one way or the other, and the employee cannot mm -hmm. be employed, and thereby um, the termination would be justified. Uh, this is my contribution. Uh, thank you very much for your, your attention. And if there are any open questions, I'm uh, very happy to take them. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Martin. Uh, is there anybody from the panel who would like to uh, ask a question to Martin? He's been waiting patiently since early this morning, so I'm sure he's eager to answer a few questions on the way they're doing things in Austria. Um, what's interesting for me, Martin, is that you put much more emphasis on the testing part than we do here in South Africa, for instance. Yeah, if you... and we spend, you know, millions of euros on uh, testing because uh, it's all public testing schemes. So uh, you can get a PCR test every day if you really want it, and it's free. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, currently, the, if you do a test, it's also free, but if you go to a private laboratory, you will have to pay. Um, and what I also found interesting, you can test yourself out of wearing a mask if you can do enough tests. Yeah. Uh, that's still the option, but this is under discussion now, because, uh, of course, um, this doesn't really uh, boost the vaccination rates uh, mm. at all, because all those persons uh, who don't want to get vaccinated, they have an alternative, which from an individual point of view, uh, I would consider very much justified. But if you look from the general uh, epidemiological policy point of view, where the vaccination rate uh, is not an individual choice, but uh, an act in a way also yeah. of solidarity, uh, then this gets much more tricky. And I think the discussion uh, of this morning showed uh, that there are uh, many aspects beyond the workplace which should also be considered, but it's not on labor lawyers uh, to do this. Yes. Uh, our job <laughs> is to balance the interests of employees and employers. Yeah, that's right. Martin, once again, thank you very, very much for your very valuable contribution. Um, I don't have any further questions for Martin, if there's uh, anybody else or not. Um, well, I want to conclude this. Uh, I mean, this topic is so interesting, we can go on and on, but we, unfortunately we don't have the time. All of us have got other work. What I've learned from this experience this morning is that there are certain things that bind us together as human beings and the way we deal with an epidemic which is something new in the modern world um, and the way we approach this e epidemic there are certain trends that we can see in every single country the way we deal with it in the workplace in terms of mask wearing and vaccination and social this that's different um, what also came out to me is that all of us and i think 
Israel had a few cases, but they're waiting for some more. There's one in Austria. All of us are waiting for our courts to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. Um, and Professor Kuhn from Attila, he said, it's not for our labor lawyers to speculate on this. I really want to thank each and every one of you. The moment I contacted you, not one of you hesitated to agree to participate in this discussion. As I said, it was an informal discussion to try and get uh, us talking about these things and maybe learn from one another. Um, and I want to thank my university, Northwest University, for the opportunity and the people from our uh, marketing team that assist us. You will see they've put some banners up here. The director from my school, from the School of in, uh, Industrial Psychology and Human Resource Management. Uh, once again, thank you very much. And I hope very, very soon we will be able to meet each other face to face where we can sit around some nice wine or a nice vodka in Russia and really sort out the world's problems dealing with Corona. Thank you very much and I wish you all a very wonderful day. Thank you.